Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the March Economic Development and Industrial Corporation of Boston board meeting, which is being held virtually to ensure the safety of the public, staff members, and the BPDA board members during the COVID-19 pandemic. The open public meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV, which is part of the City of Boston Cable Communications at Xfinity Channel 24, RCN Channel 13, and Verizon Fios Channel 962, and live streamed also at www.boston.gov forward slash cable. First uh, item, take a roll call, the members, and um, Ms. Downs. Present. Dr. Landsmark. Present. Mr. Miller. Present. First meeting, first item, sorry, is the minutes. Um, requesting authorization for the approval of the minutes of February 11th, 2021 meeting. So moved. Ms. Ms. Downs. Uh, aye. Uh, oh, oh, you need a second. Oh, second. Second. Okay, motion was made and seconded by Mr. Landsbach. So, Ms. Downs. Aye. Dr. Landsbach. Aye. And Mr. Miller. Aye. Item number two, administration and finance, request authorization to amend the existing ground lease with Coastal Cement Corporation for 77,425 square feet of land and improvements located at 36 Dry Dock Avenue within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Industrial Park. Dennis Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Coastal Cement Corporation has been a tenant in the Raymond Alpha Marine Park since 1985. Uh, you may recognize the four giant cement silos at the easternmost portion of the Marine Park. Um, the cement is manufactured in Portland, Maine, and is barged into Boston where it is loaded into the silos. Um, it is a textbook case of a 100% maritime industrial use. The initial 1985 lease is scheduled to was scheduled to expire in 2010 with several five-year option terms. I'm here today to request approval of a lease extension with Coastal Cement Corporation for the continued use of 36 Rydock Avenue in the Raymond Alpha Marine Park for seaborne delivery and land distribution of cement. As a condition of the extension, Coastal Cement has agreed to the following terms and conditions. Uh, the leased premises will be reduced from 77,000 square feet to 68,000 square feet. As I mentioned at the February board meeting, uh, that will allow BPDA to lease uh, the additional land to the abutting tenant, the Massachusetts Port Authority, to assist in the ultimate expansion of the 88 Black Falcon uh, Avenue building. <clears throat> Coastal will now pay its proportionate share of uh, uh, BMIP, I'm sorry, BPDA operating expenses in the Marine Park. Um, Coastal will also pay all real estate taxes assessed on the premises. The current lease puts that liability entirely on BPDA. Um, Coastal will also pay a 2% transaction fee in the event that the sale, uh, the lease is either sold or refinanced. In exchange for these accommodations to BPDA, um, the lease expiration date will be extended from 2030 to 2050. Uh, we're also proposing that the current rental rate of $5.33 per square foot of land be reduced to $2.75 per square foot of land. This is in recognition of the imposition of the tax liability to coastal cement. Um, that rate will escalate by 3% each year for the duration of the lease term. <clears throat> um, now, prior to entering the negotiations with coastal cement, BPA procured the services of an independent financial consultant, Kirk and Company, to assist in BPA's internal uh, analysis. And we also procured an independent appraisal from um, prominent firm Colliers International for the purposes of determining the sec uh, second opinion of the appropriate rent to charge. Uh, BPDA and Kirk and Company both believe that the $2.75 per square foot land rate proposed would be appropriate in the current market, provided that taxes and utilities are not included in that rate. With the tax imposition estimated to be over $2 per square foot, Coastal's cost of occupancy will still exceed $5 per square foot uh, net of utilities. We believe that the proposed rent structure, along with the shifting of the tax burden from BPDA to Coastal Cement, is consistent with the market for industrial land in Greater Boston. Although the annual rent paid to BPDA decreases, 
by virtue of lowering the per square foot rate from 396,000 a year to 189,000. Present value of the net cash flow retained by BPD actually increases by 61%. That uh, from 2.1 million to uh, 3.4 million. That increase is due to the extended term and the shifting of the tax burden away from BPDA. Uh, we firmly believe that these terms and conditions result in an effective win for both BPDA and Coastal Cement. Coastal Cement benefits by securing a distribution port in Boston Harbor for the next 30 years while absorbing all future tax liability. Thank you, that's my presentation. Great, thanks Dennis. Before I open it up to the board for questions, um, I would imagine, um, I know you said it reduced, but it ends up being 61% more, but we're also going to be picking up revenue from Massport's additional square footage, correct? That's correct. Yeah, good. Nice uh, nice work. Any Thank questions you. from the board? Seeing none, what's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Thank you. Motion made and seconded. Ms. Downs? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. And Mr. Miller? Aye. Motion made second passes. Thank you, Dennis. Number Thank three. Thank you very much. Request authorization to enter into a license agreement with the Office of Returning Citizens for the use of approximately 1,382 square feet of space in suite number 301, located at 22 Dry Dock Avenue within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. Maureen O'Flaherty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. The City of Boston Office of Returning Citizens, referred to as ORC, has been a tenant at 22 Dry Dock Avenue since 2017. ORC is located in Suite 301, which is approximately 1,382 square feet of space on the third floor. In 2014, Mayor Martin J. Walsh created the Office of Public Safety to tackle the challenging problems in our neighborhoods that lead to and perpetuate violence. In 2017, Mayor Walsh created the Office of Returning Citizens, which serves and supports individuals who return to Boston after being released from state, federal, and county facilities. ORC offers programs that help to secure basic necessities like housing, employment, and health care. At this time, staff is proposing a one-year license agreement with ORC, which will be renewable automatically for six-month terms. The term shall commence on April 1, 2021 and expire on March 31, 2022. In February 2021, the BPDA authorized the issuance of a request for proposals, an RFP, for the redevelopment of 22 Dry Dock Ave. It is anticipated the construction of a new development will commence in late 2023 or early 2024. Due to the social service mission of ORC, it is recommended that the rent be waived. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Any questions from the board? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. Ms. Downs? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. And Mr. Miller? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Maureen. Item number four, request authorization to enter into a lease agreement with college-bound Dorchester, Inc. for the use of approximately 2,186 square feet of space in suite number one, located at 22 Dry Dock Avenue within the Raymond L. Marine Park. Maureen, again. Thank you. The Maritime Apprentice Program, also referred to as MAP, was founded in, 20, in 2004 by the Hull Life Saving Museum and has occupied Suite 109 and 22 Dry Dock Ave since that time. Suite 109 is approximately 2,186 square feet of warehouse in an open industrial garage type workspace on the first floor. MAP is an intensive multi-year program that prepares Boston's most high-risk youth for adult responsibilities and careers in the technical trades. MAP provides hands-on skills-based training in combination with counseling and work readiness preparation. In 2015, MAP was acquired by College Bound Dorchester, otherwise known as CBD, which is a Boston nonprofit founded in 2009 and provides students similar hands-on skill-based training at the Seaport Boat Shop. At this time, staff is proposing a one-year license agreement, which will be renewable automatically for six-month terms. The term shall commence on April 1st, 2021 and expire on March 31st, 2022. In February 2021, the BPDA authorized the issuance of a request for proposals, RFP, for the redevelopment of 22 Dry Dock Ave. 
It is anticipated that construction of a new development will commence in late 2023 or early 2024. Due to the social service mission of CBD, it is recommended that the rent be waived as well. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Maureen. Yes, I'm very familiar with uh, the good work College Bond Dorchester does. Any questions from the board? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And I vote for the motion as well. Thank you, Maureen. Number five, request authorization to amend the lease and license agreements with Boston Pride for the use of approximately 1,500 square feet of space in suite number 504 and the use of cage B7, located at 12 Channel Street within the Raymond L. Marine Industrial Park. Maureen Flaherty. Thank you. The new Boston Pride Committee has been located at 12 Channel Streets in, two, in space, uh, suite 504 since March of 2016. Boston Pride was established in 1970 and is a 501c3 not-for-profit not organization, which is committed to creating spaces for people of all walks of life and all identities. Suite 504 is approximately 1,500 square feet of large open space without air conditioning or office build-out. It is used as office space, meeting space, and event planning space. Cage B7, which is approximately 1,315 square feet, is a cage storage area in the basement of 12 Channel Street. On March 17, 2016, the BPDA board approved a five-year lease agreement with Boston Pride for Suite 504. The lease term shall expire on March 31, 2021. Boston Pride currently pays $25,324.08 annually for Suite 504. On October 12, 2017, the BPDA board approved a license agreement with Boston Pride for for cage B7 as storage. The term of the license shall also expire on March 31st, 2021. For cage B7, Boston Pride currently pays $10,512 annually. Staff is proposing to extend the term of the lease for suite 504, as well as the license for cage B7. Both shall commence on April 1st, 2021 and expire on March 31st, 2026. A recent market analysis conducted by BPDA staff concluded that the market rate for suite 504 is approximately $23 per square foot, triple net. The recent COVID-19 pandemic caused restrictions on public gatherings, and thus Boston Pride has been unable to effectively fundraise and has experienced a 73% drop in revenue. BPDA staff is recommending that the rental rate paid by Boston Pride for suite 504 remain at its current level for a period of two years to allow Boston Pride to regain its fundraising traction. Commencing April 1st, 2023, fixed rent for Suite 504 shall increase to $23 per square foot and shall increase annually by $1 per square foot until the lease expiration in March, 2026. For KHB 7, Boston Pride shall continue to pay $10,512 annually. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Any questions from the board? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Thank you. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I vote for the motion as well. Thank you, Mari. Thank Number you six, uh, request authorization to adopt a formal non-discrimination policy for EDIC programs and activities and to adopt and implement a language access plan. Renee. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the board, Madam Secretary and Director Golden. I'm here to request your approval of a formal written non-discrimination, I'm sorry, non-discrimination policy that applies to all BPDA programs and activities, as well as approval of the BPDA's language access plan. On September 10th, 2020, the BPDA entered into a voluntary compliance agreement with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development regarding certain measures for the BPDA to formally implement in accordance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and its associated federal regulations and executive order. Under the voluntary compliance agreement, the BPDA agreed to put out a form formally approved non-discrimination policy for all BPDA's activities and conduct. 
The non-discrimination policy before you today encompasses non-discrimination in everything the agency does and has been doing from external engagement, legal documents and requirements, and hiring. In addition, under the agreement, the BPDA agreed to create and implement a language access plan. I'm pleased to introduce to you the BPDA's new language access coordinator, Ahmed Hamsa, who will explain in detail what the language access plan includes. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Director Golden and Madam Secretary. Uh, my name is Ahmed Hamza and I am the BPDA's language access coordinator. Um, I began this role in February of this year, so just over five weeks ago. Um, I graduated from UMass Amherst in 2018 with a degree in civil engineering, um, and I'm very passionate about languages and linguistics, and so I'm super thrilled to be here with you all and with the BPDA. Um, in order to uphold the BPDA's goal of inclusive economic growth, a request is before you to adopt a language access plan to ensure meaningful access to our public process for limited English proficiency or LEP individuals. By following the guidelines of this LAP, the BBDA will continue to take steps to provide inclusive access and engagement in the development review and planning processes. The LAP will apply to Article 80 large projects and the PDAs local, located in communities with a significant composition of LEP individuals. Throughout the Article 80 process, there are opportunities for the community to engage, voice their questions and concerns, and provide feedback for our development review process. The LAP focuses on these areas and provides guidelines for the BPDA to make that engagement more equitable through language services. To assess the need for language services in each community, the BPDA's research team continuously updates demographic and linguistic data by assessing the American Community Survey administered by the US, uh, US Census Bureau. This survey is administered in each community to get as large a sample size as possible, and the data will be continuously updated to observe trends in linguistic diversity. The LAP takes this information and highlights the key, the key threshold languages in each neighborhood of Boston, which allows us to focus on the kinds of languages, language services required to engage the community. To support the LAP's assessment, feedback will also be analyzed to address any needs that the census might have missed. In addition to the main LAP, project proponents will also provide project language access plans, or PLAPs, PLAPs, for individual projects to further detail the strategy for community engagement and inclusion. In the PLAP, proponents will address the threshold language or languages they are targeting and outline the plan to provide language services needed to meaningfully engage the community. Myself as LAC, I will ensure the implementation of the LAP and ongoing compliance by the BPDA. In addition, I will continue to collaborate with other city departments such as the Mayor's Office for Language and Communication Access. Implementation of the LAP requires an understanding of the language assessments mentioned previously, as well as the services available to address them. There will be two language services provided through this plan, translation services and oral interpreting. Translation services are available to ensure meaningful access to the public process by translating into these threshold languages, the vital documents and other useful information. The LAP lists vendors that provide these services to the BPDA, as well as the languages they specialize or concentrate in. In addition, oral interpreting is available for LEPs at, at public gatherings. And the PBDA will notify the public of its ability to accommodate listeners via oral interpreting when meeting announcements are publicized. Um, it will be provided in threshold languages as applicable and as analyzed in the plan. The LEP allows for alternative measures to provide language services, including technology tools, um, in situations where language services would create administrative or financial burdens on the BPDA. Um, all of the above mentioned services, along with the overall LAP, will be communicated to the BPDA staff via training and engagement. Um, and to further explain this training, in order to inform the BPDA staff of the LAP implementation, the following steps will be expanded upon in future meetings. Um, and these steps are an overview of the LAP, an overview of the request process to access language services, um, and how to work with interpreters. Um, and also as LAC, I will be tracking language services throughout the request and execution stages and address any issues with the development review and planning team. In addition, training requirements will be analyzed to ensure that the BPDA staff has an understanding of the LAP and its implementation. Information regarding language services provided will also be reflected in a quarterly report. Um, provisions of language services for the public will be communicated 
through event postings and initial meetings with the community. Uh, the LAP also allows for partnerships with community organizations, allowing the BPDA to access demographic and communication needs. And lastly, the BPDA will incorporate feedback from the community to better understand how we could improve on the implementation of the LAP and any other issues that might arise in the meantime. With that, we hope that the implementation of this language access plan will fuel inclusive and consistent engagement from the communities in Boston, especially those who are limited in their ability to speak or communicate effectively in English. In doing so, we hope to foster inclusive growth throughout the city of Boston. Thank you very much for your time, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Ahmed. Are there any questions of uh, Renee or Ahmad from the board? <clears throat> I, I have a question. Um, first, welcome, Ahmed. We're very excited to have you here. I'm very excited, Renee, to be putting this plan in place. Um, I've had to do uh, set up translating at my old business for our staff, um, provide live translation of our staff meetings. And um, one of my questions is that the plan allows for us to use sometimes our own staff as translators and also mentioned using Google Translate as uh, to translate documents. To me, both of those seem like um, I feel concerned about having those two options in the plan because translation is such a skill and we need to be providing it on a professional level, especially given all the complicated language that's involved in our development um, meetings. So can you talk about the vendors that we're going to have? Should, should we have a firm that handles all of our translation or how are we going to make sure that all the translation we're providing is at a very professional level with really good equipment and um, not informal. Can you talk about that, please? Yes, thank you, Mr. Downs. Um, the main provider for translation and interpreting services are certified vendors um, and interpreters. The, the LAP does allow for assistive technology, for example, or um, BPDA staff, should they be available to provide interpreting um, if other options are unavailable or if they create some kind of administrative or financial burden. Uh, but the main focus is, um, as you mentioned, to have certified and professional interpreters, which there is a list of provided by the LAP um, and a list of um, vendors that have previously worked with the LAP, uh, with the BPDA as well. And may I just elaborate that we've had internal discussions about um, this issue that you're raising um, and your concern, and we also agree, the staff does agree, that the um, the services provided really, it, the staff, um, including the staff in there, it was really just as support or, in, you know, as sort of a, um, in case something came up at, the, um, at, a, at a meeting, but it's really intended for us to use our um, professional, um, our, our professional interpreters and, and and vendors, not for this to, to come down on onto the staff. Thank you, Renee. Any further questions? Yeah, I, I have two that um, spin off of the previous question. Um, one of the issues we inevitably have is that. Um, we're translating substantive information and data, uh, which can often be uh, very complicated uh, and uh, sometimes very technical, so that the um, simple translation of words um, doesn't necessarily open up a clear meaning uh, when we're talking about a development process or a construction process. And I wonder whether, um, if it's not already built into uh, this new process, whether we can uh, begin uh, something of a training program uh, that would uh, better prepare uh, our, our translators um, not only to translate the words, but really to explain some of the meanings, um, uh, particularly given that uh, my understanding is that at this point, nearly 30% of Boston's residents are um, uh, new immigrants into uh, Boston and into the country with a very wide variety of um, language skills um, and uh, uh, countries of origin, but not necessarily a deep understanding of the development process and of the process of um, 
uh, really comprehending what the neighborhood impacts of some of our projects may be. Uh, and so I wonder whether we're building in uh, some kind of training for the more specialized uh, translations we need. And then my second question, which I'll ask at the same time is, um, it sounds as though we're going to be developing some extremely rich data um, on neighborhood changes um, and uh, language and demographics. Uh, and I wonder whether that um, new data that's being uh, developed will be uh, widely available to the public that is interested uh, in uh, trying to assess the neighborhood changes across the city. Um, Ahmad, would you like me to answer? Um, I can answer those oh, questions. Yes. <laughs> um, first, uh, so we spent, we entered into the voluntary compliance agreement with, with HUD um, last fall, and we spent several months working on the language access plan because we did need to take into account um, some of the things that, that are being raised here today. And Dr. Landsmark, one of them was the fact that we do have in the development review process, and um, we understand that it can be really technical and um, confusing, not just to um, folks that are limited English speakers, but also just to any any person out there. So our LAP plan is designed so that first and foremost, we can translate vital documents. And so what we did was we created a list of vital documents and one of the vital documents for every everything we're doing from plans to um, development review, we will be able to do summaries of, uh, and executive summaries of these more difficult documents and then, so those will be translated so that they're, you know, so those are available in, in the languages that are, um, that, that are, tr are triggered. And then what we plan to do from there would be to have um, interpreters and work with interpreters so that they can further explain um, the documents, what they're about and those contents. And um, we do anticipate, and you are correct in pointing out that we will have to work with um, the interpreters um, and, and there will need to be some training on what our processes are and, and what these documents mean so that the translations and meanings can can really come through. So that's the, that's the first thing. We did try to build that into the LAP. Um, the development review and planners now are, real, are working really hard. They're working, you know, internally to figure this out and then also externally they've engaged already some um, engineers and consultants that do a lot of Article 80 review projects so that they can figure out um, the best way to um, sort of get this information um, uh, translated and, and, and out there. Um, so, so, and then on the, um, I'm sorry, can you please repeat your second question? I just- well, the, sec the second question just relates to how much of of our demographic uh, oh, analysis of yes. neighborhoods uh, is, is going to be available beyond the agency. Oh, yes. So our research department has already been making available all the information that they've been putting together um, for our LAP as well as for the cities. The city is also doing one. They were, they were another uh, the other party to the voluntary compliance agreement. And so, um, so everything they do it's it's been made available and I believe you are correct that um, from what we're doing now we are going to be um, gathering um, new data and information and so um, I would expect that the research department will continue to use that information and make it available to the public and and to anyone else who's looking for it and we're working very closely with the city because again they're also using um, the BPDA research um, for their LAP as well Thank you. Good. <clears throat> Any further questions? Thank you, Renee and Ahmad. Um, what's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Uh, second with enthusiasm. Motion made and seconded. Uh, roll call, Ms. Downs? Aye. Dr. Lampock? Aye. Mr. Mella? Aye. And I am voting for the, for the motion as well. Item number seven, uh, David, personnel? Uh, yes, thank you, members of the board, Director Golden and Madam Secretary, David Pierre, Director of Human Resources, and there are several items for your consideration this afternoon with the details in your board memo. We have two appointments. Angel Guzman, 
Planner One in the Planning Department with a start date of April 20th, and Rebecca Hansen, a Senior Advisor for Real Estate Portfolio Management in Real Estate with the start date of July 19th. We have two status changes. Catherine Gall, Deputy Director for Planning and Policy Development in the Office of Workforce Development, and Morgan McDaniel, Real Estate Development Officer in Real Estate. And we have one departure, Molly McGlynn, the Assistant Director of Communications in the Communications Office. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, David. Any questions, David? Seeing and hearing none, with the pleasure of the board. So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And I'm voting for the motion as well. Thank you. That concludes the EDIC portion of the meeting. Um, <clears throat> moving on. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, adjourn? You need, you need to adjourn, correct? OK. Is there a motion to adjourn? I move we adjourn the EDIC meeting. Second. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor, Ms. Downs? Aye. Dr. Landsbach? Aye. Ms. Miller? Aye. And I am voting with the motion to adjourn. Thank you for joining the March Boston Redevelopment Authority board meeting, which is being held virtually to ensure the safety of the public, staff members, and the BPDA board members during the COVID-19 pandemic. The open public meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV, which is a part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications at Xfinity Channel 24, RCN Channel 13, and Verizon Fios Channel 962, and also live streamed at www boston.gov forward slash cable and we're going to first take a roll call of uh, the board members for this portion of the meeting miss downs you present dr landsbach present yes i'm present sorry <laughs> no, no problem miss downs is present mr landsbach answered present mr miller present and I am present. Um, item number one, request authorization for the approval of the minutes of February 11th, 2021 meeting. The pleasure of the board. So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call. Ms. Downs. Aye. Dr. Landsbach. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And I vote in favor of accepting the minutes. Item number two. Request authorization to schedule a public hearing on April 15th, 2021 at 5.30 p.m. or at such a time and date deemed appropriate by the director regarding the application of Center Street Partners LLC through an affiliate for a phased affordable housing redevelopment project involving a portion of the Mildred C. Haley Apartments located on Center Street in Jamaica Plain for authorization and approval of a project under Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 121A in the Acts of 1960, Chapter 652, each as amended. Dana Whiteside, please. There's no presentation on this. It's just there isn't. Okay, I have Dana's. I have Dana's. Uh, yeah. Name there. So um, the pleasure of the board. So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call. Miss Downs. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And I'm voting for the motion. Item number three, planning and zoning. Board of Appeals, Jeff Hampton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, planning staff has uh, prepared 85 petitions for transmittal to the Board of Appeal. Uh, these will be heard at the ZBA's meetings uh, on March 23rd. Uh, March 30th, April 6th, and I believe April 15th. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Jeff, I have a question before I open it up to the board. Are you seeing, so the 83, I really haven't uh, been keeping a record of every meeting. Is 83 pretty consistent with what we've seen over the, the last five years? Have you seen an increase, decrease? It's actually increasing. It is. Uh, um, the numbers are increasing, and the planning staff's doing a great job. They were actually, you know, it would have been a lot higher 
However, we were missing a lot of information from ISD. We originally had 117 appeals, um, but because we just didn't know what the violations were, we couldn't write recommendations. Very good. Any questions of the board of Jeff? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Second. Motion made and seconding. Roll call, Ms. Downs? Aye. Dr. Landsbach? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I'm voting with the motion to accept the Board of Appeals report by Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Number Thank four. You, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Policy number four, request authorization to adopt a formal written non-discrimination policy for BRA programs and activities and to adopt and implement a language access plan Renee and Ahmad, I don't know if we have to get in uh, covers much, but it's up to you. Um, it's the same presentation um, that we just uh, provided a few minutes ago. Um, okay. Any questions? I'm good with that. I don't think it's, even though it's a different meeting, it's within a short period of time. Um, I don't have any further questions. I'm not sure if the board had thought of any more since uh, under EDIC. No, I'd say it was well described the first time around and, and appreciated. Thank you. Good, good. So hearing no uh, questions, what's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Thank you. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs. Aye. Dr. Landsbach. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And I'm voting with the motion. Number five, request for proposals, invitations for bids and contracts. Request authorization to execute a third amendment to the consultant services contract with the NBBJ LLP for the downtown planning study for an extension of time only. Ken and Ryan. Good afternoon, members of the board, um, Director Goldman, Secretary Paulinas. Um, thanks for having me. My name is Ken and Ryan. I'm the interim deputy director for downtown and neighborhood planning and the project manager for Plan Downtown. So, for a little bit of background, on August 16, 2018, the BPDA authorized the director to enter into a contract with NBBJ for the downtown planning study, which I'll refer to as Plan Downtown for the rest of this presentation. Um, the contract was not to exceed an amount of $600,000. That contract was executed on September 21st, 2018 um, with NBBJ. In general, uh, at a high level, the scope items associated with that are um, kind of an existing conditions analysis for the entire study area, developing a series of planning visions and goals, um, doing a series of development scenario um, analyses, kind of refining those in one clear direction, and then our ultimate goal is to release urban design and development guidelines and zoning recommendations along with a broader plan document. Uh, on November 14th, 2019, the director was authorized on behalf of the BPDA to execute an amendment to the original contract, which increased the amount by $150,000. The increase of this amount was associated with the development of the Plan Downtown Advisory Board. Um, this was an additional scope item, and so we had to kind of extend the contract to cover that item with our consultants. When Mayor Martin J. Walsh uh, declared a state of, of public health emergency in March and mid-March of last year, the BPDA paused the public review process for all development projects and planning initiatives. BPDA staff planned to host two additional advisory group meetings and one public meeting before releasing the draft plan downtown document for public comment. Since the public review process was temporarily paused, NBBJ and its subconsultants have paused all work associated with the project. On July 16, 2020, the director was authorized to execute um, another contract amendment, um, which extended the scope by eight months to April 30th of this year, April 30th, 2021. The BPDA and MBPJ entered into this contract amendment on September 4th, 2020. Um, we're looking to extend that again at this point in time. The project has remained on hold um, during that time period and we have not engaged the public again or kind of extended our external work with the consultant since that time point. BPDA staff recommends that the director be authorized to execute a third contract amendment um, with NBBJ and extend that by an additional 12 months until April 30th, 2022. There's no additional cost associated with the contract extension and the current contract termination date, as I mentioned, is coming up soon, April 30th, 2021. Um, that concludes my presentation. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. 
Thank you. Are there any questions of Ms. Ryan? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I'm voting for the motion. Um, number six, request authorization to amend the contract for consultant services with Sasaki Associates, Inc. for the 4.100 acres in South Boston open space plant by extending the term of the contract. Mr. Christo. Good afternoon, members of the board. Madam Secretary, Director Golden. Uh, my name is Joe Christo. I'm the Senior Resilience and Waterfront Planner on the Climate Change Environmental Planning Team in the Planning Division. Thank you for the opportunity to present to the board this afternoon. Um, I'm here to request, uh, as noted, that the director be authorized to amend the contract for consultant services with Sasaki Associates for the 4.100 acres in the South Boston open space plan by extending the term of the contract. The contract was originally signed on August 15th, 2019, at which time Sasaki Associates began work with the BPDA project team on the planning process. We are requesting an extension through June 30th, 2021. Since the project began, the consultant and project team have held two large public community workshops, 15 focus group meetings and presentations, four steering committee meetings, and conducted two community surveys. Beginning in March of 2020, any of that work um, has been conducted virtually um, after a, a, a pause, as Kevin had noted before, um, early on in the days of the early public emergency. The exciting draft conceptual plan that has resulted from this public process was presented in a draft report that was released in January of 2021. We are working with the community and our consultant on finalizing that plan this spring. Um, the plan establishes more detailed park designs for an open space network at the heart of the Fort Point neighborhood as it grows over time. Next slide, please. The proposed park network strengthens connections to the waterfront, creates a more resilient community, and expands recreation, events, and green space access. The open spaces are designed to become year-round destinations for Boston as a whole, while also meeting the current and future, future local neighborhood needs. An underlying focus of this plan is for the parks to be resilient and welcoming to all. Strategies to create a more inclusive park network are woven tightly throughout the recommendations in this plan. The plan will serve as the guide for future development of open space resources as the 100 acres is built out. It describes a vision for a connected set of distinct destination quality open spaces experiences that are reflective of community priorities and needs identified through research and analysis. In addition, the ground floor recommendations in this plan identify opportunities for indoor spaces to enhance the district experience and enjoyment uh, for park visitors. We ex are excited about completing this planning process soon, and I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you, Joe. Any questions from um, of Joe? I just had uh, one quick question. The uh, overview um, uh, of your plan here um, clearly indicates that the streetscape is also a significant part um, of what needs to be built into the resilience planning for this area. Um, and, and I wonder whether the draft plan, which I haven't had a chance to take a look at, but I wonder whether the draft plan um, also incorporates streetscape improvements that will address issues of resilience. That's a great question, Dr. Lansmark. I appreciate it. Um, and, and I'll be, I'll be sure to I'll send you a link to the draft plan uh, following the meeting. Um, but yes, it does. Um, there, there are streetscape improvements that are recommended um, in line with the uh, open space improvements. You know, as, as you noted, the two have to go hand in hand um, when thinking about uh, not only resilience, but also accessibility and connectivity to other parts of the city. Thank you, Joe. Any further questions? Joe, I, I have a question. So I'd like to see that at some point too, the draft. The, sure. um, so on this, with the Sasaki, what they're doing, are they actually making recommendations also on um, zoning as far as what, what, we, what we approve here and what we approve at the ZBA? Everything from being an electrician comes naturally, switch gear transformers. Um, are they going that far to say that, you know, we should not be placing 
uh, electrical distribution equipment in the basements of buildings along the waterfront? Is, is it going that far, or is it just more of a open space and roads? You know, the, this plan in particular is more about the open space and roads and, and how, how those um, contribute to district scale um, um, climate resilience. But the things uh, you're citing are, are more addressed both through our flood resilience zoning overlay district um, as well as Climate Ready Boston, the, the two initiatives that this plan works uh, closely aligned with. Very good. Thank you, John. Any, um, any further questions of Joe? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Thank you. Motion made and seconded. Roll call. Ms. Downs? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I'm voting for the motion. Next item, license agreement, lease memorandum of agreement, number seven. Request authorization to enter into a licensing agreement with the New England Aquarium Corporation for use of a 200 square foot portion of a BRA owned property located at East India Row for the purposes of outdoor dining and utilizing a BPDA owned kiosk for food service support of the Harborview Cafe from April 1st, 2021 to March 31st, 2022. Lauren Fernstein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. In 2007, the BPDA board authorized the director to enter into a license agreement with the New England Aquarium for the use of property located at East India Row adjacent to the Simons Theater in the downtown waterfront for the purpose of utilizing a BPDA owned food vending kiosk. The license has been extended through multiple BPDA managed RFP processes and the aquarium has consistently been awarded the vending rights. NEA also operates the Harborview Cafe inside the aquarium building. COVID-19 related social distance requirements and seating capacity restrictions have caused the aquarium to use the dog and claw kiosk as an operational satellite food service station for their indoor cafe this season. The license area will also be used as a public seating area for visitors. The proposed license will be in effect from April 1st through March 31st, 2022. No fee is proposed for the use of the BPDA property. However, NEA will pay a fee for the continued use of the kiosk. The fee will be $600 monthly for the length of the term. The fee represents a 75% reduction from the fee um, for the year prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, which is equal to the rent reduction offered to other vendors on Long Wharf in our COVID recovery efforts. The license term will include two individual extension options at the then current fair market value for the BPDA owned land and kiosk and will be presented to the BPDA board for consideration at a future board meeting. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Lauren. Any questions of Lauren? I, I, I have done. one. Good. Um, Good. I'm assuming that the uh, aquarium uses uh, a separate vendor for um, servicing uh, this cafe and the kiosk. Is that correct? Uh, so in the past, it has been correct. But because of COVID um, regulations right now, uh, the kiosk is actually unusable as a full restaurant um, because of distance requirements. Um, so right now, because their restaurant is inside, they're going to encourage people to eat outside at uh, tables that they're setting up. Um, and at this point, the dog and claw um, can't be used for the normal purposes. So what, what I'm wondering um, uh, is uh, whether there are any um, incentives or directives uh, to the aquarium uh, around their procurement to try to uh, focus that uh, procurement on firms owned by uh, women, people of color, and Boston residents? Uh, going forward, we'll have a discussion again about um, putting this out for RFP for this season in particular because um, the changing requ requirements for everything to do with COVID, uh, we decided that this would be the safest um, decision for um, this season. Um, we'll have a discussion about it going forward. But I assure you, I will um, encourage them to make sure they diversify their vending. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Any further questions? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? So moved. 
Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs? Aye. Dr. Landsbach? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I vote for the motion as well. Number eight, request authorization to amend the license agreement with CHLN Inc. for the use of approximately 5,375 square feet of land adjacent to the Chart House restaurant on Long Wharf for seasonal outdoor restaurant seating. Lauren again. Thank you. In December 2020, Mayor Walsh and the City of Boston Licensing Board announced the continued support of the plan, providing increased outdoor seating availability for restaurants in Boston. The City's Licensing Board, in conjunction with the Public Improvement Commission, Transportation Department, and other agencies, have undertaken a temporary, non-precedent setting initiative to encourage expanded use of public and private spaces for outdoor dining. The Chart House restaurant at Long Wharf, located on BPBA property, qualifies for this program and has requested an extension of its current license for seasonal outdoor seating. The Chart House restaurant is owned by CHLN Inc., but operated under the umbrella of Landry's Restaurants, which is headquartered in Houston, Texas. In June 2019, BPBA entered into a license amendment with Landry's for the use of land in front of and behind the Chart House restaurant on Long Wharf to be used for seasonal outdoor restaurant seating. A series of amendments have been brought before this board and in July 2020, the license was amended to extend use through March 31st, 2021 and to abate the license fee for the remainder of the term to support efforts to aid small businesses during COVID-19 pandemic response. The proposed term for the 2021 outdoor dining season will allow the Chart House restaurant to temporarily utilize outdoor space on BPDA property for outdoor dining through March 31st, 2022 without a license fee. The proposed license amendment does not contemplate options to extend the term. Any proposed extension of the license with Landry's beyond the term expiring March 31st, 2022 will require staff to reevaluate the market at that time and an appropriate rental rate will be established for board consideration in the future. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Lauren. Any questions of Lauren? Hearing none, which the pleasure of the board? So moved. Second. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I'm voting for the motion as well. Number nine, request authorization to enter into five-year license agreement with Blue Man Boston Limited Partnership for use of approximately 2,978 square feet of land located adjacent to the Charles Playhouse on Warrington Street for a trailer. Ms. Finstein? Bernstein. Bernstein, Blue Man Group is a performance art company occupying a full residency at Charles Playhouse since 1995. In July 2017, Lumen Group was bought by Cirque du Soleil. In March 2020, responding to the 2019-2020 worldwide coronavirus pandemic, Cirque du Soleil announced that all 44 active shows worldwide would be suspended and that 95% of their staff would be temporarily laid off effective immediately. On June 29, 2020, the company announced that it had filed for bankruptcy protection. Since then, they've emerged from bankruptcy and have been sold to the former CEO of MGM Resorts International and an investment company, investment company Catalyst Capital. Blue Man Group had been unable to pay rent since live performances at the Charles Playhouse ceased and are currently $47,000 in arrears. Their license had been scheduled to expire in January 2021, which made them ineligible to apply for the rent deferment program created to aid tenants of the BPDA. However, this new license applies the spirit and policies of the deferment program to the proposed payment schedule. This license sh term shall begin on April 1st, 2021 and expire December 31st, 2025, with one conditional five-year option term. During the term of this license, Blue Man Boston Limited Partnership will pay to the BPDA $276,909 in market rent, plus an additional $49,072 in deferred rent owed for a total payment to the BPDA of $325,982.
thanks. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, any questions of uh, Lauren? Hearing none, which is the pleasure of the board? So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I'm voting for the motion as well. Uh, item number 10, request authorization to amend the lease with Charlestown Marina, LLC, for use of water parcel D to extend the rental market adjustment date to May 1, 2022. Ms. Fernstein. Water parcel D consists of 174,902 square feet of water in the Charlestown Navy Yard. The water parcel has no direct access to land and is only accessible from the adjacent Charlestown Marina. Charlestown Marina was established after the owners of Ocean Havens LLC and in Chocolagasi purchased the adjacent property from Shipyard Quarters Marina in 2014. After closing on the acquisition, the Legacies created Charlestown Marina LLC. In August 2015, the BPDA authorized the lease of the water parcel D to Charlestown Marina LLC to incorporate it into the new Charlestown Marina. In order to incentivize Charlestown Marina LLC to lease water parcel D for the 45 year term, and in recognition of the repair requirements of the Massachusetts Attorney General that mandated them to bring the marina back into compliance, BPDA agreed to a charge a flat fee of $35,000 for each of the first five years of the lease. Both parties agreed to revisit the rent payment in 2020 after five years of operation to evaluate the market and negotiate a new base rent and periodic ex escalations effective May 1st, 2020. This is the second request to extend the date of the market rate adjustment due to the unknown impact of COVID-19 on the marina industry and its recovery. To ensure that a market rate can be established by April 30th, 2022, we've agreed to expedite, expedite a formal analysis by acquiring an independent party appraisal. The selected appraiser will form an objective opinion of the appropriate lease rate to charge for the use of the BPDN water sheet including periodic escalations to commence May 1st, 2022 for the duration of the lease term. The base rent to be paid to the BPDA from May 1st, 2021 to April 30th, 2022 will remain $35,000. Thank you, I'm happy to answer any questions. Good, thank you, Lauren. Any questions of Lauren? Hearing none, was the pleasure of the board? So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I'm voting for the motion. Item number 11, request authorization to enter into a license agreement with Black Owl LLC for the use of approximately 2,850 square feet of land adjacent to the Dovetail Restaurant at building number 34 in the Charlestown Navy Yard for seasonal outdoor restaurant seating and Lauren, they're working you overtime tonight. So <laughs> this is my last one for the month. Yeah. Building on the city of Boston and BPDA's commitment I described previously in respect to outdoor dining, the Dovetail Bistro also qualifies for support within the city's small business COVID-19 program. The new Dovetail restaurant owned by Black Owl LLC has recently opened in the Charlestown Navy Yard in the space formerly occupied by the Navy Yard Bistro. In June 2020, the board authorized a license agreement with Black Owl LLC for the use of approximately 2,850 square feet of land in the Charlestown Navy Yard for the seasonal outdoor restaurant seating due to expire on March 31st, 2021. Licensee is responsible for obtaining any and all permits and licenses which may be required for their use of the licensed premises for the proposed uses. The proposed terms of the Black Owl LLC for the 2021 outdoor season will allow the Dovetail Restaurant to temporarily utilize outdoor space without a license fee through March 31st, 2022. Any proposed extension of the license with Black Owl will require staff to reevaluate the market at that time and an appropriate rental rate will be established for board consideration. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Lauren. Any questions of Lauren? Hearing none, was the pleasure of the board? So moved. Second. 
Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I'm voting for the motion. Item 12, tentative final designation extension conveyance. Request authorization to extend the final designation of Catalyst Ventures Solidarity Enterprises, LLC, as the redeveloper of parcel L43B, located at 41 Regent Street in the Washington Park Herbal Renewal Area. Ray Panessi. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Madam Secretary, Director Golden, and members of the board. I'm here to request a 90-day extension to final designation status for Catalyst Ventures Solidarity Enterprises, LLC, a 100% Black-owned development entity consisting of a joint venture partnership between Daryl Settles and Greg Janey. As a reminder to the board, this developer was selected through a competitive request for proposals process in 2017. This redeveloper is proposing to combine 41 Regent Street, which is a 3,224 square foot BPDA parcel with the adjacent 5,703 square feet parcel at 64 Alpine Street, which is owned by Mr. Settles. Um, the team is, is planning to build 14 home ownership units, including two income restricted IDP units. The combined parcels create a site size of approximately 8,927 square feet. The building permit was issued November 3rd, 2020, and today's final designation extension will allow the legal teams to continue finalizing documents for closing, which is expected to occur within, to occur within the coming weeks. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Any questions of Ray? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I'm voting for the motion. Next item, Thank certificate. You. Thank you, Ray. Next item, certificate of completion. Number 13, request authorization to issue a certificate of completion for the successful completion of the Seaport Square Block M project located at 145 Seaport Boulevard in the South Boston Waterfront neighborhood. Aileen Kerr. Thank you, Mr. Monaghan. We have no presentation, but we are happy to answer any questions the board may have on this item. Very good. Are there any questions for Ms. Kerr? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? Now moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I'm voting for the motion. Number 14, request authorization to issue a certificate of completion for the successful completion of the Parcel K project at 315 Northern Avenue in the South Boston Waterfront neighborhood. Ashling again. Thank you again, Mr. Vice Chair. Same goes here. We're happy to answer any questions the board may have. Great. Anybody have any questions? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I'm voting for the motion as well. Thank you, Ashley. Article 80 Development IDP, um, which is not open to public testimony, South Boston, number 15, request authorization to is issue a determination pursuant to section 80A-6 of the zoning code in connection with the fifth notice of project change for the proposed development on parcel five of the Massachusetts Port Authority Marine Terminal within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Industrial Park to divide the project site into three separate sub parcels for phased development parcel five and to take all related actions. Ms. Kerr. Thank you and good afternoon again, Mr. Monaghan, Director Golden, Madam Secretary, members of the board. BPDA staff is pleased to offer a recommendation of approval for this fifth notice of project change to the parcel five project of the Massport Marine Terminal in the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. The last approval authorized by this board, the fourth notice of project change in February of 2018, allowed for the construction of a project totaling approximately 211,360 square feet of marine industrial uses across two separate phased buildings. After entering into a development agreement for the project site in April of 2019, pilot development partners submitted a fifth notice of project change to the BPDA on January 19, 2021. 
Under the fifth NPC, the proposed project remains largely unchanged from that which was last approved by this board through the fourth NPC. In addition to establishing a new developer, the fifth NPC proposes the division of the project site into three separate sub parcels for development of the project. Pilot Development is also the developer of Parcel 6 of the Massport Marine Terminal, which is similarly being developed in several phases, the first of which saw the recent opening of Boston Sword and Tuna's new facility. The BPDA is pleased to support Pilot's expanded efforts to provide high-quality marine processing facilities in the Flynn Marine Park. Both the proposed project here on Parcel 5 and the approved project on Parcel 6 provide important opportunities for expansion within the city of Boston for the many local seafood companies which have long called the Marine Park and other industrial areas across the city home. We are joined this afternoon by representatives from Massport, as well as Eden Milroy and Catherine Maines of Pilot Development and Project Architect Cheryl Tobias. BPDA staff and the development team will be happy to answer any questions the board may have at the conclusion of the project presentation. Thank you. I'll now introduce Catherine Maines of Pilot Development. Catherine, you can just let us know when you want the slides to advance and our staff will do that. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. Ah, I'm getting conflicted. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to make this presentation. It's very exciting to bring um, Stavis to a new building. They've looked for a new facility for expansion and for consolidation a long time and their first new ground up building in 40 years. The building will be the most resilient at Massport's Marine Terminal, three feet higher than the projected 2070 flood level. Next slide, please. We see the relative location here with downtown Boston as a landmark in the center. Next slide, please. Here we see Boston's Convention and Exhi Exhibition Center as the landmark in the middle, showing the relationship with Parcel 5, fortunately in a very bright magenta. Next slide, please. The, uh, did we, we lost a slide, okay. Uh, this is uh, what it looks like now as the next slide is. And it is sometimes used for overflow parking. Next slide, please. This site plan shows Davis on Boston Harbor in the first phase stage. They need to establish ongoing operations there to understand better about the balance of processing versus cooling space for the second stage. And that slide's been changed. All right. Next slide, please. Boston Sword and Tuna opened April 2020, a year ago almost, representing new engagement with marine industrial placement in the working port of Boston. We wanted to celebrate that because they're out in a very remote place. Next slide, please. Stavis will move into the most resilient facility so far at the Massport Marine Terminal with their next, with their ground floor at three feet above predicted flood levels for the year 2070. Next slide, please. This shows the new Stavis first stage building across Codfish Way from the existing Boston Sword and Tuna with the flagpoles. Next slide, please. And the bird's eye includes other buildings that are now undergoing various stages of design that will be, of course, present, be presented in turn through the Article 80 process. Next slide, please. Boston is pleased to introduce the Stavis project to the public as we proceed and given BPDA approval toward groundbreaking. 
Thank you very much. I'll turn questions over to Eden Milroy, if you have any. Thank you, Catherine. Are there any questions of uh, any of the presenters? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Thank you. Motion made and seconded. Roll call. Ms. Downs? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I'm voting for the motion. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you all. Good number, evening. Great. Number 16, request authorization to issue a certificate, certification of approval in accordance with Article 80E, Small Project Review of the Boston Zoning Code for the construction of eight residential units with ground floor commercial and office use located at 658-660 East Broadway and to take all related actions. Nick Carter? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the board, Director Golden, Madam Secretary. Uh, my name is Nick Carter. I'm a project manager with the BPDA. Uh, we are here before you this evening to discuss the proposal at 658 through 660 East Broadway. This project was originally approved through the ZBA. However, given its size, it is necessary to undergo uh, sort of a post facto Article 80 small project review. Uh, this project will create eight housing units, a shared workspace, and an enhanced restaurant split space for the playwright on the first floor. Uh, in addition, the project will create an enhanced public realm on East Broadway. Following a robust community review process led by the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services and the proponent, the City of Boston Zoning Board of Appeals voted its approval for the construction of a new mixed-use development project on November 12, 2019. Following approval by the ZBA, it was determined by the Inspectional Services Department that the proposed uh, project would require review and approval under Article 80E, Small Project Review of the Code. The proponent subsequently submitted a small project review application to the BPDA on November 12, 2020. In connection with the small project review submission, the BPDA hosted a virtual public meeting to discuss the proposed project on March 2, 2021. Uh, I would now like to introduce John Polgini on the development side to go through the presentation. And uh, if there are any questions after, I'll be here to answer them along with the development team. Thank you, Nick. Uh, good afternoon, <clears throat> Mr. Monaghan, members of the board, Director Golden, Secretary Palamas. I'm John Polgini on behalf of the 654-660 East Broadway Realty LLC. Thank you for having us here this afternoon. With me today is Joey Akari, who's the owner of the property, together with Dennis Greenwood, the team architect. Nick did a great job highlighting the community process and proposed development. In addition to Nick's comments, our team is pleased to contribute what we feel is a proposal that encompasses the city's goals, especially as they relate to the Main Street District. We worked tirelessly with the BPDA staff as well as with neighbors to ensure the design was not just acceptable, but something both the residents and the neighbors can be proud of and will contribute to the energy of East Broadway. On behalf of the development team, we are excited to implement the proposed development and seek your support in that effort. Thank you again, and I will now turn it over to Dennis Greenwood, uh, the team architect, to walk through the designs. Thank you, John. Uh, so we can go on to the next slide. Again, I'm Dennis Greenwood with Sousa Design Architects. Excited to walk you through the proposal. Um, Nick kind of already highlighted most of the stuff on this sli slide, but essentially the project is a mixed use development. The first floor is gonna be mostly uh, used as a restaurant space, as an existing restaurant on the lot now. Um, there's currently three buildings on the lot, which you'll see in the, the forecoming slide. Those buildings are gonna be raised for one uh, larger building. We're still gonna rehouse the playwright on that space. Up above on the second floor is a workspace that's gonna be a shared use space. It's 6,100 square feet. And then the two floors above that are residential for eight total units. So we can go to the next slide. So on the left, we have the locust map, just to give you a little bit of context. We're located uh, in between the, the public library and to the right is a single story building that's currently uh, being looked at for development. It's the, the liquor store, which you can see in the photo on the upper right. The blue building that you see, which is the, the two story building is on the lot that is 654 East Broadway. 
And then the Playwright Building, which is the Brown three-story building, is 660 East Broadway. Both buildings are on the property. Those will be raised, and that's the site of the proposed building. In the rear, there's actually 660R, which is a smaller building, which also houses another three residential units. As part of the proposal, that will be removed as well. So we can go on to the next slide. And I'll keep it brief here, but essentially the footprint on the right side of the building, we had less than a three foot setback on the existing conditions. We worked with the city to bring that in through the design review process. That's now five feet along the entire length of the building. We previously had that rear building at 660R that was very tight to the, the back of the property line. We've pulled that in. There's now a 20 foot rear backyard. We're using that as an amenity space for the residences. Uh, that's not accessible for any of the restaurant patrons, but we did feel it was a good amenity for the residences up above and it helps create a little bit more open space in that behind the building and gives a little bit more light and air to the adjacent properties as well. Around the back perimeter, we're also doing a privacy fence. We're looking at uh, some arborvitae trees for additional privacy and some grills to increase that amenity space. At the front, you can see the restaurant, the uh, residential entry is on the left side. The restaurant entry is on the right side. We're creating a vestibule there uh, for energy efficiency as well, also as a buffer for the occupancy inside. Next slide, please. So this is the exterior elevation. It, again, it's four stories. We're at 45 feet for the building. We're creating a rhythm of five bays along that facade where the first floor is the playwright, the restaurant use. We're breaking down the scale of those windows with these uh, simulated divided light windows and then the transoms up above. We have a steel sign band that runs continually across the front to demarcate the portion that is that retail tenant and then the residential entry is on the left. We're using Juliet balconies on the second and third floor to kind of punch that and accentuate those bays. And then on the fourth floor, we set back five feet to help reduce the massing of the building and we use dark hardy plank siding for that change in material to again kind of create a three story reading along East Broadway. The brick actually wraps around the right side and the left side of that back over 30 feet so that the brick kind of takes on the strong presence on the streetscape. So we can go on to the next slide and we'll see that in renderings as well. So again, you can see the brick turn the corner back that 30 feet. We have this projecting uh, small little storefront at the first floor to, to demarcate that restaurant use. And again, using kind of the rhythm of the classic brick with kind of clean detailing in a contemporary way to, I think, really improve that streetscape along East Broadway. Next slide, I believe. John, you want to take it over here? I think that's the presentation. Um, thank you for having us. Any questions, we'd be happy to answer. Very good. <clears throat> Thank you, John. I will say um, your client, Mr. Your client, Mr. Kari, the last two projects he did in Savin Hill uh, are excellent. I tell you that you'd have to look a long way to find two better architecturally built. I don't know if you were the architect, Dennis, the one on Pleasant on the corner of Pleasant, and the other one that's on Savin Hill Avenue. Um, yes, wasn't it? That was you. Yes. Nicely done. I tell you. The um, so I don't have any further questions. Does anybody have any questions of uh, any of the presenters? Um, I do. Brian? Uh, thank you. I had uh, second that uh, Joel Akari has got a, a great reputation and has done some really good work and been supportive of the community. But I'm re re reviewing a few of the notes from some of the abutters and some of the longtime neighbors. I did see some concern about large decks and uh, outdoor fire pits and some concern that that backyard, which looks inviting, might. Um, lead to some late night parties and things along those lines. So I, I'm just wondering, maybe John, you're the best one to answer that. Uh, how did that end up? And, and uh, were you able to work with the vast majority of the neighbors or how does that stand? Uh, yes, 
Brian, thank you for the question. Um, we went through a, as uh, Nick said at the outroad, this project initially started out as just a strictly zoning board of appeal project because it was going to be an addition onto the existing structure where the playwright sits. However, once that was approved the, um, through engineering, they realized that it wasn't stable enough to support it. So the aggregate changed to over 20,000. So we had gone through an extensive process. I probably myself have attended 10 community meetings with the abutters to address all the specific issues, whether that be noise, whether that be um, light, whether that be crowd control and all different things. And we went through the BPDA design review. They had requested that, you know, let's bring the building in. So this building actually has uh, been reduced in size and in uh, density since um, what was approved at Zoning Board of Appeal. And the BPDA asked us to, you know, let's make a livable space out back. That included fire pits and some grills, uh, we recently had the um, Article 80 public meeting for this, and that issue came up with respect to the fire pits. Mr. Akari at the time said if there's an issue with that, he does not, I mean, he was doing that for the benefit of the, the residents, and it would only be exclusive to the residents, and it's only eight units. Um, but if that was an issue to anybody, that would be something that, you know, we would certainly not proceed with. But we have worked extensively with the neighbors. And, and again, uh, Mr. Miller, that did not come up until you know, last week, previous to that, it was all based on sound and what's out of security and some, you know, lighting and things like that, which we have reached agreements with the abutters on. Great. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Any further questions of the presenters? Um, I, I just wanted to um, also commend the architect for uh, creating a, a building facade with some a real visual interest and it's nice to see that rather than simply having a, a flat uh, residential facade as, as we so often see. Um, so I, my, my kudos to the architects on this. Thank you, I appreciate that. I, I echo that Mr. Lansbach, that brick um, architecture really caught my attention on the front. There's, a, there's some old, old type of uh, designs which is nice to see. Any further questions of the, of the uh, presenters? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I'm voting for the motion. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Rochester, item number 17. Request to authorization to issue a certificate certification of approval in accordance with Article 80E, Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the construction of two buildings consisting of 21 rental units, including three IDP units, 19 off-street parking spaces, in ground floor retail located at 1121 Dorchester Avenue to recommend approval to the Board of Appeal for zoning relief necessary and to take all related actions. Mr. Rosa. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary and Director Golden. The proposed development before you is 1121 Dorchester Ave in Dorchester, which is the result of a comprehensive planning study for the Glover's Corner neighborhood. 1121 Dorchester Ave contributes directly to the guidelines of Plan Glover's Corner with its proposed active ground floor, height, and density along Dorchester Ave. 1121 Dorchester Ave LLC proposes to construct an approximately 34,480 square foot development. The project will contain two buildings. Building A will front Dorchester Ave and will contain four stories, 21 rental units, three of which will be affordable, and 19 off-street parking spaces. Building B will front Savin Hill Ave and will contain three stories and three rental units. The proposed project will also contain ground floor retail on Dorchester Ave. The small project review application was submitted on January 22nd, 2021. One public meeting was held on February 17th, 2021, and the comment period ended on February 22nd. Comments received included a letter of support from Councillor Baker. At this time, I will turn it over to the development team to go over their presentation in more detail, after which we would be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Eric Robinson, uh, Rody Architects. Uh, hopefully we can uh, build on the goodwill. This project is also, um, the client is Joey Akari, um, coming to Dorchester again. So we're excited to hear the positive feedback from the previous project. I think 
This project, um, while a little bit of a different context, we believe has a lot of the same characteristics uh, that were found in the previous project. Next slide, please. Um, as Ebony's already run through in terms of the, the, the logistics of the, the project, we're excited to be here. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, just touching on this, and we have a, a little bit more about the Glover's Corner. So um, I'm, I'm excited to work on this project as a 20 year, 21 year resident of the Savin Hill area. And I live a couple blocks away very active in my own community um, and was part of the Glover's Corner study. It's exciting to be able to now start working within the context of the study. And so, um, you know, this is this is sort of going to be the first project that will be happening um, near my house. And, you know, I think that the study has given us a set of guidelines that we can work within um, and also create great a great project. So next slide, please. As, as mentioned, the, the, the project will consist of two buildings, um, mainly because of the, the odd shape of the lot, which you can see highlighted in the center of the screen on the left. It is an L-shaped configuration that touches both uh, Dorchester Avenue at 1121 and then at Savin Hill Avenue at uh, 31 Savin Hill Ave. Um, as you can see in the photos on the right-hand side, uh, the L-shaped configuration is currently uh, an automotive repair and sales shop and then as it turns around to the corner behind a row of businesses that are currently active um, there's a small single family unit as you can see in the middle photo that affronts uh, Savin Hill Avenue and then just another view of the existing conditions of the auto body um, uh, program that's there now the building to the left in um, tan will remain and then the building in the foreground to the right, which is a, a local gym, will also uh, remain uh, not part of this project. Next slide, please. So these are just some of the images that we uh, used during our public process. Um, we did have one uh, very well attended public meeting. We've also been to the um, Columbia Savin Hill Civic Planning Committee, I think three times. Um, and they did vote on Tuesday night to support this project and we'll be taking it to the, the local uh, full board for approval at the beginning of next month. So we're excited to see a project that, again, works within the context of the study and can be embraced by the community as well as a successful project in the neighborhood. Next slide. So some of the metrics is, as Ebony mentioned, so we do have 21 units in the yellow building. We'll have a large scale uh, restaurant space that Joey will be running um, as one of his uh, restaurants. So we're excited about that. With respect to siting the building, um, we have pulled the building back on Dorchester Avenue to create an extended sidewalk to create um, some additional outdoor seating. So we're really excited about activation on the ground floors. The other businesses up, as you can see, between our building and Savin Hill Ave do not have that opportunity as they are currently uh, existing buildings, but we're looking forward to setting a precedent and new projects within this study can really uh, act, use the sidewalk to their advantage for um, some commercial space. And then you can see the smaller, um, building that's located in blue up against Savin Hill Ave. That building is being envisioned a little bit more consistent with, I would say, the traditional uh, triple deckers that we see along Savin Hill Ave in terms of its its scale. Um, it's a little bit more contemporary, but um, it's really consists of three through units, about 1,200 square feet, which will be two plus uh, bedroom units. So we're super excited about that. And then with respect to um, the larger 21 unit building, um, that consists of a mix of ones and three bedroom units with some one pluses um, mixed in as well. So it has a nice um, sort of blend of units that have um, decks associated with, with each one of them and some outdoor space. So we're excited about the residential program uh, consistent with the commercial program at the ground floor. Next slide. So just some of our uh, building sections and elevations, we too are looking at a, a, a sequence of bays that will activate the street. As you can see in the section where we're pulling back 
the ground floor uh, to allow for some outdoor seating. There'll be parking below the restaurant on the back side of the building, and then some of his uh, kitchen support space in the, in the basement with the main restaurant on the ground floor, and then the residential units above. Um, one of the things we did work with the community on is pulling the rear of our building back um, a little bit farther from the property line. So we're excited to be able to introduce uh, some green space between that. That will really be passive. It won't be an active and program green space. Just being a little bit more consistent with some of the rear abutting lots uh, facing Deer Street, which is our uh, company street on the other side. Next slide. So some of the renderings of, of the envisioning of the project. So Joey's really asked us to create a, a, an architecture that will be timeless. So we introduced a series of oversized windows within all of the units. So we're really excited about the amount of glass and transparency that these units will have. And then introducing brick in a contemporary way. So this is a fully brick building, um, utilizing some great detailing that'll enhance the quality of this project. And as we're hoping to really set forth a high bar for all the future development that we soon will be coming along Dorchester Avenue in this, in this direction. So you can see on the ground floor, we have the two separated entry sequence that will be the residential to the left-hand side with the main restaurant entry space to the right-hand side. And then in the bottom right, you see um, what we're looking at in terms of the three family unit on Savin Hill Ave. So a little bit more contemporary, but we wanted to make sure it had large windows and outdoor space associated with it as well um, to, to activate it, uh, that part of the street. Next slide. So that concludes our presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Are there any questions of any of the presenters? I just had one about um, uh, having a kitchen space in the basement. Um, presumably that meets all codes, but um, I've always wondered when, when I've uh, been to restaurants where there are downstairs kitchens, um, why it is that there aren't uh, easier ways for um, uh, chefs and, and staff uh, to get the food to the eating area without having to go up and down stairs. And I wonder whether some provision, I know it's a very minor detail, but I do think about the workers here. Is there some provision that has been made here or could be made um, in order to make it easier for um, serving staff uh, to not have to run up and down stairs with trays of food? So the answer is yes. Uh, in this particular case, it's not the kitchen downstairs. I should have clarified that. It's more storage and dry storage and sort of aspects. So the kitchen will be upstairs. This is more support space, um, probably an office and, and some other things. But um, your point is well taken. We do do a lot of restaurant work um, in some of our, a lot of, uh, throughout the city. And I, I'll be honest, it's, it's an amazing feat that restaurant tours go into some of the craziest spaces and they really make them work. So. Um, it is something that we think about when we're, we're working on our projects in the city, and I think it's something that uh, I commend you for recognizing that because, you know, I think it is it is tough, and but I think that we find that restaurants, you know, they, they're usually, um, it's a dream that they're going into these spaces, and a lot of times they don't have a lot of money, so they're trying to make things work. Um, but it is something that we do consider um, when we're designing our restaurants. But in this case, that's really just a support space for the restaurant itself. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Any further questions? Hearing none, it was the pleasure of the board. I'm sorry, uh, Chair Monahan. Yeah. Quinn Balsich is on from Councillor Flaherty's office to speak on this matter. Oh, great. Okay. Quinn? Hi. Hi. Good evening, members of the board. Thank you very much. My name is Quinn Balsich. I'm here on behalf of City Councillor Michael Flaherty to testify in support of this project. This is a project that fully conforms with Plan Glover's Corner and bring both new housing and a quality restaurant to enliven and invigorate this section of Dorchester Avenue. Uh, Joey Arcari does top-notch work and his restaurants in the city are distinguished by their quality and professional operations. This is the kind of solid mixed-use project we need in the main commercial corridors of our local neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Thank you, Quinn. Any further questions? Comments? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Second. 
Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And I vote for the motion. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Number 18, request authorization to amend the terms of the affordable rental housing agreement and restriction in connection with the project located at 500 Talbot Avenue. Mr. Carter. Uh, good evening, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the board, Director Goldman, and Secretary. Uh, we're here before you this evening to discuss the inclusionary development policy change proposed at 500 Talbot Avenue. Uh, as you may remember, this project was originally approved by the board uh, at the November 8, 2018 meeting. Uh, this project was originally proposed with 40 units, five of which were proposed as IDP units to be rented at 70% area median income. Uh, tonight, we ask you to consider terminating the original affordable housing agreement and enter into a new affordable housing agreement with the owner. Uh, the proponent has proposed to reduce the amenity space in the building and increase the unit count to 42. Uh, additionally, the number of IDP units would increase to six with the new additional uh, two bedroom unit being rented at 100% area median income. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your time and consideration on this proposal and I urge you to vote in favor of the change. And if you have any questions for me, uh, or the proponent, I think believe they're on this call as well. Very good. Thank you, Nick. Are there any questions of Nick or the uh, developer? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Thank you. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And I'm voting with the motion. Congratulations. Thank you. South End, item 19. Request authorization to terminate the existing affordable rental housing agreement and restriction and enter into an affordable housing agreement connection with the project located at 1950 Washington Street. Mr. Carter again. Uh, thank you again. Uh, I'm here before you to discuss the inclusionary development policy change proposed at 1950 Washington Street. Uh, this project was originally approved by this board at the October 2018 meeting. Uh, we'd like to ask you to consider terminating the original affordable housing agreement and enter into a new affordable housing agreement with the Community Development Corporation of Boston. Uh, the proponent proposes a change of affordability of affordable units, uh, a mix of studios and one beds um, to all two bed units in the new affordable housing agreement. Uh, additionally, two of the units will be rented at 80% area median income and two will be at 100% area median income. One of the 100% affordable units will be built out as an accessible unit under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, thank you for your time and consideration. And I again urge you to vote in favor of this proposal. And if you have any further questions, please. Thank you, Nick. Any questions of Nick? I'm curious as to what the reasoning is behind the change. Uh, I believe the development corporation uh, feels that it better serves the neighborhood and they have uh, the funding to make it um, viable. Thank you. Any further questions of Nick? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call Ms. Downs. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I'm voting with the motion. Congratulations. Thank you again. Moving on to Fenway, item number 20. Request authorization to waive further review of the institutional master plan notification form for the renewal of the Wentworth Institute of Technology institutional master plan dated January 15, 2021, and to approve the renewal of the Wentworth Institute of Technology institutional master plan dated 2011 pursuant to section 80D-5.2E, section 80D-6, section 80D-8 of the Boston Zoning Code and to issue an adequacy determination approving the IMF-PMF for renewal pursuant to section 80D-5.4 of the Zoning Code for an additional two years. Eddie Carmen. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary, and Director Golden. 
The proposal before you is the Wentworth Institute of Technology Institutional Master Plan seeking a two-year renewal with no changes to the existing IMP. The proposal does not include any new development projects, but rather it simply seeks to renew the IMP, which was formally approved and adopted in 2011 for a period of two years. The PDA staff feel this is an appropriate renewal in light of the pandemic, as it gives Wentworth the necessary time to assess its own campus needs and then engage in a thoughtful 10-year IMP review process. This renewal serves as an update to Wentworth's operations in Boston and previews its potential future plans. The Wentworth task force gathered virtually on February 3rd and is supportive of this renewal. I will now turn it over to Dave Wallstrom, Wentworth's Vice President of Business to go through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Mr. Monahan, Director Golden, and members of the board. As, uh, as was stated, our purpose here is to request a two-year renewal of our institutional master plan, which expired in January. Uh, before, next slide, please. Thank you. Before starting, I wanted to briefly touch on the goals guiding our master planning efforts and how these goals align with significant, with the significant role that the community plays in development at Wentworth. As you can see from the slide, Wentworth's master plan focuses on living, learning, and community. These tenants have guided Wentworth over its last 10-year institutional master plan and will continue to do so as Wentworth moves forward into a new institutional master plan. We'll revisit this slide at the close of the presentation and I'll explain how Wentworth's master plan takes into account and serves both its own internal community and the community in which it resides. Next slide, please. Thank you. Master plan, um, master plan prior to this, um, excuse me. The master plan prior to this, um, what would became a uh, residential community, uh, doubling the number of beds to 1950. This master plan provided amenities to support a residential community. Uh, added 305 more beds and allowed us to renew some academic facilities. On hold is the relocation of, of Sweeney Field, which is E shown here on the master plan. Next slide, please. Situated between several tight-knit and densely built communities, Wentworth sought to open up its campus to its neighbors both the physical grounds and the institution of higher ed uh, via scholarship and ramp programs. And our community outreach didn't stop during the pandemic. In fact, we continued many benefits such as scholarships, pipeline programs for Boston youth, Strive workforce development. We've had 6,000 um, Boston public school students go through the program in 30 years and the maintenance of the Evans Way Park, and we've been involved with that since 1980. While many of our donations are connected to events, events have been canceled. We worked with the community to find other ways to contribute, such as donating grocery store gift cards, school supplies, as well as furniture for local students attending schools remotely. And when our neighbors at, Fort, at 69 McGreevy Way were impacted with COVID-19, we gathered household supplies and masks, all of which were hard to come by at the time, and delivered them in collaboration with our state rep, Nika Elugato. Next slide, please. Mark Thompson became Wentworth's fifth president midway into 2019. We started down the path of a strategic plan with the goal of a timely institutional master plan renewal. That is until COVID derailed us. Now with the strategic plan completed, Wentworth has engaged the services of a real estate team that brings the real estate experience of Cushman and Wakefield in the higher ed planning expertise of Brailsford and Dunleavy to look at our programs, enrollment, housing, financials, facilities, 
in all the possibilities. And this will serve as the basis for development of our next institutional master plan. We very much intend to be back in the pipeline within the next year. Next slide, please. As Wentworth digs in to plan its next 10 year institutional master plan, it will focus on three tenants referenced at the beginning of the presentation. Live uh, Wentworth and the city share the goal of moving students on campus and Wentworth has made good progress in the last 10 years and will continue to do so with new dorms and revitalization of existing spaces. To learn, Wentworth strives to improve and appropriately expand its programmatic and educational options so that all graduates will continue to become significant parts of the workforce in the Boston economy. And at any given semester, Wentworth has 600 co-op students working in the local market and will continue to nurture local industry partnerships to support our programs. And from the community perspective, we want to expand impactful community partnerships. As mentioned earlier, uh, we want to maintain strong community relations. It's to all of our benefits. And with that, I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dave. Uh, before I open questions, I have a, a comment. I'm in my 40th consecutive year in the building and construction trades. And I'll say that your graduates are on practically every construction project I've ever been on, both as uh, interns or the, as graduates. And um, you, you graduate a, uh, the skills they have, the skill, the attitude, and behavior are the three that necessary to succeed in any business. But um, you turn out a, one heck of a graduate, I, I'll have to say. Thank you, kids. Mr. Chairman. Thank yeah. you. Are there any questions of Dave? I, I would um, echo. Uh, what was just said and uh, add to that that um, uh, based on everything I've seen uh, within the neighborhood, uh, Wentworth has also been um, very civically engaged uh, with the immediate community. Um, and my understanding of what it is you're trying to do now is to uh, translate your new strategic plan into a a physical plan in a way that will continue to provide those kinds of benefits. So um, I, I think uh, giving you the time to do that, given what has happened uh, with COVID makes uh, a lot of sense. And uh, it appears that you're continuing with that uh, community-based uh, uh, beneficial commitment. We are. Thank you, Dr. Lansmark. Very good. Any further questions? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs. Aye. Dr. Lansmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And I'm voting with the motion. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Very good. It is uh, 5.20. Teresa, are we going to uh, take a 10 minute break for the public hearings to start at 5.30? Let's keep going. Let's, let, let's, Let's see if we can get uh, 23 and 24 done and then take a okay. five minute break. Sounds good. Okay, moving on to item 23 and under administration and finance. Request authorization to accept $2,051,903 mitigation funds in connection with PDA number 106, 1000 Washington Street in 321 Harrison Avenue in the South End Project to disperse said funds to the City of Boston Arts and Cultural Fund and to enter into a grant agreement with said entity. Mr. Carter. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the Board, Director Bolton, and Madam Secretary. I'm here to discuss the 321 Harrison Avenue project. Uh, as you may remember, again, this project was approved by this board on September of 2016. Uh, in that project, the developer agreed in the original plan development area to create 10,454 square feet of affordable cultural space on site as required under the zoning. Uh, 5,971 square feet of which has been leased by the developer to the New England Foundation for the Arts. Uh, tonight, I'd like to ask you to consider a buyout of the remaining 400 
sorry, 4,483 square feet of affordable cultural space that remains unleased in full compliance with cooperation group. Uh, the proponent will contribute $2,051,393 to the BPDA, which will then be distributed by the BPDA to the City of Boston Culture Fund. The City of Boston Culture Fund will distribute the payment to cultural spaces, organizations, programs, artists, and uses in the South End with the goal of preserving and enhancing cultural activity. Funds will be focused on the EDA South with the option to expand the geography to the neighboring areas of the South End in order to achieve the desired impact and spend down the funds. Thank you for your time and your consideration on this project, and I'm here to answer any questions if you need. Thank you, Nick. Are there any questions of Nick? If I understand this correctly, uh, the developer is taking a portion of space that was originally set aside for uh, performance venues, uh, buying that out and making a contribution to the city um, so that the city can now disperse those funds to um, neighborhood organizations around the city, but that the initial commitment to uh, using that entire space as a performance venue um, is, is now being stepped back from. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Yeah, Chair, I think that was a question, Nick. Is that that's uh, way, that's being presented, right? Yes, I would turn that over to uh, Jonathan Greeley to answer that. Very good, Jonathan. Is Jonathan on? Number Monahan, if you could just repeat that question for me. I think Ted was the question was from Mr. Landsbach, and it was just basically summarizing what the motion is um, sure. with the space being taken over by the developer and that money being sent to different groups around the city. So it's a great question. The um, under the underlying zoning through which this project was permitted, um, the uh, developer has an option to buy out uh, uh, fifty percent of the uh, affordable space. And so uh, pre-pandemic, they were able to lease that space to a nonprofit in the area. Um, and then they have uh, moved forward with the option to buy out at an agreed upon amount um, based on a calculation uh, also clearly identified in the zoning. Um, this money will be utilized in partnership with the city's arts and culture department to support arts and culture efforts throughout the zoning area. So the money will not quote unquote leak from the vicinity. It will be spent in the Harrison Albany area. Um, I also would suggest that maybe the uh, Norbloom can talk a little bit about um, the tenant they did lease to and their efforts to lease the space leading up to this uh, proposal. Okay. George, uh, Jonathan, Mr. Chairman, Todd Fremont Smith with Nordblom Company. Um, just, a, just a slight clarification. Uh, the space was never intended per se to be performance arts, uh, performance space. It was intended to be affordable cultural space. So we went out into the market to look for nonprofits that were in the arts uh, or music world and, and or the cultural world and we did uh, successfully locate um, uh, NIFA, New England Foundation for the Arts, and, and NIFA was looking for a new uh, headquarters. So we did, uh, did a turnkey deal and built out their space for them and installed them in the space. They're very happy at 1000 Washington. Um, but as, as Mr. Greeley indicated in the post-COVID environment, uh, we, were, we were unable to find other uh, nonprofits to fulfill our, uh, the balance of our commitment. We did achieve the required 50% on site, uh, so it was it was an amount of square footage below 50% that we're seeking to buy out, and as Mr. Really indicated, the, the the buyout number is, is we we feel is significant, over two million dollars that will go into local arts and culture. So um, we uh, ask for your support. And and by local, um, do you mean South End only, or are you uh, expanding that scope? Because there's been a bit of creep. Uh, in terms of um, what the boundaries of the South End are. Um, and, and when it's been advantageous for some people, they've called parts of Roxbury the South End, and when it's disadvantaged, uh, disadvantageous, uh, they don't. And um, it, if, as I understand, uh, these funds are going to be distributed locally, then I would hope um, uh, given this location, that that would also include areas such as uh, Nubian Square and Wadette Circle and other um, arts venues that are not very far away from this particular site. 
Member Landsmark, um, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent question. And I would just uh, respond that um, this is a product of the Harrison Albany zoning district. As such, the funds are intended to be spent in that district, uh, largely anchored by the corridor um, 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 in the south end between Harold and Mass Ave, um, uh, between um, uh, Washington Street down to Albany Street. Um, uh, the funds will be uh, coordinated and spent through the uh, uh, the city's arts and culture department. So I think it's a fair question, and I think that uh, I think that there is probably some adjacencies slightly beyond the district that could be considered. But the focus really is the Harrison Albany district for the money to be spent in in, in support of arts and culture activities, um, aspirations, et cetera, within the zoning district. Okay. Well, I, I hear that, and I guess I would just. Uh... Uh, point out having been involved with uh, the arts for a long time and and once upon a time having been a, a board member of NIFA which is a wonderful organization the Nubian Square is every bit as close to this location as is the Boston Center for the Arts and um, I, I would hate to see uh, a distribution uh, of these funds um, for um, areas that are uh, not necessarily as close as other areas are, even understanding uh, what the zoning maps and our own maps uh, might dictate. So understanding that, I would certainly hope that the distribution would take place in an equitable way um, that, that would share this $2 million resource across a broader area. Uh, Member Landsmark, I think that's an excellent point. I, I think we're really proud of the collaboration with the, the city's arts and culture team and, and the work they've done um, on equity and inclusion, I think on a number of areas uh, throughout the Walsh administration, but also recently. And so um, I'm quite confident that they will have that lens on this money and thinking about this also, not just as a kind of one-time financial opportunity, but also an opportunity to disperse funds over a period of time and think about sustainability of arts organizations in that corridor. And as you know, that corridor has a rich history of, um, of the arts, of big A arts, with a lot of different things in that corridor. And so I think um, as that corridor has evolved over time, I think there's been some challenges um, for organizations headquartered in that region. So I think, um, I think there's, a, uh, there's a real attempt to do right by that community. And your point about geography and adjacency um, is really well taken. Uh, those comments will be passed along to uh, the city's chief of arts and culture, Cara Elliott Ortega, who is who will be leading the efforts to think about what comes next. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. And Nick, any further questions? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And I'm voting for the motion. Item 24, request authorization to disperse $100,000 from the Harvard Austin Public Realm Flexible Fund to the Boston Transportation Department for, for consultant services regarding public improvements on Western Avenue and to enter into a memorandum of agreement with said entity for the funds. Gerald Lawler. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. Good afternoon, members of the board, Director Golden, um, Secretary Williams. Um, I will keep this brief in order to try to keep your public hearing schedule um, uh, on, on target. Uh, you, in December, approved a slate of grants from the Harvard Flexible Fund. And uh, unfortunately, at the time, we weren't aware of this particular need. This connects to the Western Avenue Corridor Study and Rezoning, about which you'll be hearing more in the near future. One component of that is to propose multimodal improvements to Western Avenue, and we are working hard with our colleagues in the Boston Transportation Department to advance that design. One thing that's missing is a detailed engineering survey of the corridor. And uh, and unfortunately, given that there's no uh, active capital project there yet, it would have been difficult for uh, the uh, Boston Transportation Department or Public Works to come up with the funding uh, on short notice. And so it seemed like a great opportunity to use the flexible fund, which is there to supplement uh, available sources of public funding um, flexibly, as the name suggests, and nimbly uh, in order to uh, fund these services. So we will uh, work with our colleagues. The The actual amount will probably be closer to $50,000, we're hoping, based on initial estimates, but we're requesting actually up to $75,000. Um, the uh, um, 
the agenda item wasn't updated in time, but that should be reflected in the board memo. Uh, so I would be happy to answer any questions, but um, hopefully that uh, uh, that's a clear explanation. Thanks. For you're asking. Thank you, Joe. Any questions of Gerald? Hearing none, it was the pleasure of the board. So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call. Mrs. Downs? Aye. Dr. Lansmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I vote affirmative as well. And we're going to try and get, we're going to do 25 personal with, um, before we get to the, uh, the public, maybe we're going to take a quick break, but then do uh, the public hearing. So, uh, personnel, David? Yes, thank you, members of the board, Director Golden, Madam Secretary. Um, we have one item um, this evening, um, one departure, Enrico Romali, Accounting Manager in Budget and Finance. Thank you. Very good. Any, any questions to David? I'm not sure a motion is needed, but we'll do one anyway. What's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Thank you. Motion to be made and seconded to accept the personnel report. Roll call, Ms. Downs? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I vote affirmative. Teresa, what would you suggest uh, before we get to the public hearings for a short break? Let's take a four or five minute break. We'll be back at 537, 538. 537, 538, got it. Very good.
We are now moving on to the public comment period of the uh, BRA meeting. Item 21, request authorization to approve the Phase 5 Building F2 Development Plan and the Phase 5 Building F4 Development Plan within PDA number 94, Bartlett Place, Washington Street, and Bartlett Street, Roxbury, to petition the Zoning Commission for approval of the F2 Development Plan and the F4 Development Plan and to take all related actions. Mr. Whiteside? I'm sorry, Mr. Mon Mr. Monaghan, you need sure. to, we tabled this item at the meeting a, a month ago, so oh, we can make a motion to remove it from the table first. Okay, sorry, yes. So we're, because we tabled it, we were gonna now remove it with an affirmative vote and then uh, take action? Yes. I, I move we table it and also, uh, Mr. Untable Mon it. I'm sorry, I move that we untable this item and I think also we need to read the section that it's a public hearing. I'll second that. So, Teresa, you want me to reread the... No, hold this? on, you need to take a vote on the motion. You need to vote on the motion. Okay, on I the... move that we uh, uh, untable this item. Okay. Second? Second. Okay. The motion was made and seconded to untable, if that's a word, um, this project, uh, and roll call. Ms. Downs? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I'm voting uh, also in favor to put this back on the agenda. And Chair Monaghan, there is language in the document, the chair's, the chair's statement for the public hearing that includes information on how to mute and unmute yourself. Okay, so you, do you want me to read that to you? So it's, yeah. it's on the screen for those people that no, are- No, it needs to be read. And where is that? Um, um, it is in the, the process document that, that you received. I, th I think I, sh I can read it if you'd like. Sure, please, please. This is a BPDA hearing on a proposed petition by the agency. Staff members will first present their case and are subject to questioning by members of the agency. Thereafter, anyone who wishes to testify about the proposed project will be afforded an opportunity. We are taking support and opposition at the same time. If you're planning to testify, please take time now to verify that your computer microphone is active. Click the hand icon on your Zoom control panel. This will signal staff that you would like to speak. When your, hand, when your hand is raised, it will be blue. If you're calling into the meeting and would like to testify, please dial star nine to raise your hand. When I call for all testimony, staff will announce your name and allow you to talk. You must unmute your microphone. Your webcam will not be active. In an effort to accommodate all who would like to speak about this proposal, each person will be given up to two minutes to comment. BPDA staff will indicate when 30 seconds remain. At that time, please conclude your remarks so that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. At the conclusion of oral testimony, any email testimony will be read aloud. Finally, proponents are allowed a period of five to 10 minutes for rebuttal if, if they so desire. And to uh, just further, this hearing was duly advertised on February 26th, 2021 in the Boston Herald. Dana? Thank you, Teresa. I, is, I'm gonna, just for the record, Teresa, put, rather than use the word untable. It's um, removed from the table. Yeah, well, that, that, this is a public hearing for the phase five development, F2 development plan and phase five building F4 development plan within PDA number 94, Bartlett Place, Washington Street, and Bartlett Street, Roxbury which was scheduled to be held on February 11th, 2021 at 5.30 p.m. Chair Priscilla Rojos moved and the board voted to table the proposed actions for further consideration. At this time, I move to take from the table the proposed actions for consideration and to hold a public hearing. So that would be the motions with the pleasure of the board. Uh, so moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs. Aye. Dr. Lanthuck? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And I vote affirmative. We'll move on to 
the, uh, the hearing. This is a public hearing before the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as the Boston Planning and Development Agency being held in conformance with Section 80A-2, 80D-5 of the Boston Zoning Code to consider the Phase 5 Building F2 Development Plan, the F2 Development Plan within Plan Development Area Number 94, Bartlett Place, Washington Street, and Bartlett Street, Roxbury, PDA Number 94, in the Phase 5 Building F4 Development Plan, the F4 Development Plan within such PDA Number 94. As mentioned, the hearing was duly advertised on, in the Boston Herald on February 26, 2021. This is a PB. BTDA hearing on a proposed petition by the agency. Staff members will first present their case and are subject to question by members of the board. Therefore, anyone who wishes to testify about the proposed, proposed project will be forwarded an opportunity um, to do so. And we're taking support and opposition at the same time. And uh, Teresa read on how you do that. So um, we'll go move on to. Uh, to um, Mr. Whiteside, if you could uh, present your, do your presentation. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the board, Secretary Paul Hemus and Director Golden. I am Dana Whiteside, Deputy Director for Community Economic Development with the agency. We're pleased to share with you this request for consideration of the approval of the two buildings within phase five of the Bartlett Place development. You'll recall from votes taken in November of 2020, that the Barnett Place development is a five phase project that is governed for zoning purposes by a planned development area originally approved by this board in 2013. The overall project will result in the revitalization of a long vacant former MBTA bus yard, which was purchased by Nuestra CDC in 2010. Aspects of the project overall, when fully completed, will include a total of approximately 382 residential units comprised of approximately 241 income restricted units, approximately 166 home ownership units representing approximately 46% of the overall housing that's being created on this site. The creation of an approximately 15,365 square foot open plaza to be known as the Oasis at Bartlett, the planting of approximately 132 130 new trees as part of open space planning and environmental sustainability. The installation of new traffic signal on Washington Street with accompanying crosswalk and traffic calming components. Um, I might suggest we go to the next slide, please. The first two slides you'll see this one and the next correspond to the, the various components of the project in terms of number of units, the uh, jobs being created, the uh, connectivity and amenities and the focus on sustainability uh, for this project. The next slide is for building F4. These two projects about which you'll hear more during the presentation from the development team are again building F2 Northampton condos of approximately 28 units and building F4 Dover condominiums of approximately 37 units. A brief note about the income restricted component of these two projects. Dover condominiums will include three units at 80% area median income and two at 100% area median, median income. Northampton condominiums will include two units at 80% area median income and two units at 100% area median income. A note of clarification that today's requested action does not represent a change in the PDA or the zoning, but solely is an approval of these two projects and the respective program, which are being part of the overall development plan. Following submission of the appropriate Article 80 documents by the development team, the process will take under underway for review with the Project Review Committee, as well as uh, review with city agencies, including uh, Transportation Department, Civic Design, et cetera. The project has received its approvals from the Boston, these projects have received, I should say, their approvals from the Boston Civic Design Commission and meetings with the Project Review Committee were held uh, as recently as January 19th. This concludes my remarks. I will acknowledge the presence of uh, David Price, Chief Executive of Northwest CDC, who along with Cliff Bomer of Davis Square Architects will advance the presentation and we will take uh, questions and move with the public hearing appropriately. Thank you. Good, thank you, Dana. David, please. Hey, thank you, I, I hope you can hear me. Um, 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and board members. Um, on behalf of Nuestra, our master site development partner, Wendale Developers, I want to briefly review the site context and community process. And I think the next slide may uh, show the actual site. There you go. Uh, as you've heard, there will be 166 home ownership units and 214 rental apartments with an overall income mix of one third affordable, one third middle income and one third market. So buildings F2 and F4, shown up at the top uh, along Lambert Ave here, uh, will contribute to the home ownership program with a total of 65 units. These will be mostly market rate and will contribute to wealth creation and increasing purchasing power in Nubian Square. We had uh, a robust community process which began in November. We've collected over 200 letters of support. And in response to conversations with neighbors and stakeholders, over the selection of a partner to develop the F2 and F4 buildings, we are committing to continuing and extending the vetting and due diligence process for that selection, for exploring possible joint ventures, and to not sign a purchase and sale agreement until that process and exploration are complete. Uh, and now, with that background, here's Cliff Bomer of Davis Square Architects to uh, review the two buildings. Thank you, David. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for hearing us tonight. I'm Cliff Bomer. I'm a principal at Davis Square Architects. We've been the master planning architect for uh, the Bartlett site for a very long time since it uh, first was uh, given over to uh, New Astor Comunidad and Windale Development. Um, we can flip to the next slide. Uh, F2, F2 is a building that, that Davis Square Architects is the uh, designer of. As uh, um, I believe Dana mentioned already, this is a building that has 28 home ownership units. Eight of them are three bedroom units. 20 of them are two bedroom units. And it comes, at the lowest level of the building includes uh, 30 parking spaces. This is in the south west corner of the site it's at the corner of lambert and guild streets it's the highest point on the site uh, what's really interesting about the bartlett site is there's some 43 feet of grade change from that uh, southwest corner to the uh, northeast corner that is the corner that's closest to nubian square uh, th this uh, as i said 30 parking spaces 28 units the inspiration for the design of this building comes from the context. The original master plan for this development has always been to use the perimeter of the site other than on Washington Street for home ownership opportunities and for uh, making the connection with uh, the, uh, the architecture of the, the close, more closely relates to the neighborhood. As you can see directly across the street, that's Guild Street to the left of F2. There's a very similar articulated uh, apartment building made of the same materials that we're proposing to the west. Across Lambert Street is a large uh, civic building, also of brick. Um, F, we can go to the next slide, I think. Uh, yeah, here's some of the context to the, to the far left. You can see the site as it stands now. Again, this is the highest point on the site. And looking around, you can see a very typical type of architecture there. The upper left-hand oval drawing shows the large civic building across the street along uh, Lambert. There are uh, further down Lambert, there are wood frame buildings. And generally speaking, a very conventional uh, types of materials for this neighborhood. Uh, we can go to the next one. This describes, it's an interesting site because uh, we provided and needed to provide access to the site for F2 from three different directions. On the lower left-hand side is uh, the closest connection for people uh, coming from the south on Washington Street. The upper, upper left-hand corner is the primary entry and if you go straight up Guild Street from there, you're going towards John Elliott Square and the or access to the Orange Line. Uh, but this building has a third entry off of the new L-shaped road that is the main infrastructure piece for the entire site. There's a diagonal accessible walkway 
that makes the last trip up from that 55 foot elevation up to the 76 foot elevation and we provided a, a, a resident entry on that side of the building as well that's the north side of the building right on the main pedestrian path uh, that, that traverses the entire Bartlett site uh, next slide are just some of the images uh, renderings of the building this is the the entry at the highest point of the site the corner of Guild and Lambert the bay articulation is very similar to the context across the street. Uh, the next image, are, we're looking at a number of renderings from this point forward. Uh, this is looking up the hill, so we're down near the Washington, closer to Washington Street. So you're looking west in this slide. You can see that the, the, there's one entry closest for autos and then a, another entry a third of the way up the building for residents and then the entry that we saw before is all the way up at the end of the building at the top of the hill. Next slide. Uh, this is that walkway that cuts diagonally across. The Liz, cut yes. my apologies for the interruption, but just a note that your time is running out, so please move oh, on. Oh, okay. Quickly. <laughs> all right, I'm sorry. Well, we, let's run through these. This shows the other entry from the interior of the site. Let's keep going because uh, I need to get to F4. Uh, a bird's eye view that shows you large uh, open space, a programmable open space that's shared by F2 and F3, as well as the site in general. Uh, moving along, uh, another view from the other direction, just a bird's eye view uh, from higher up, looking at that uh, southwest corner of the building and the apartments across the street. Uh, and then a view looking down through that large open space that connects up with uh, Lambert Avenue at the top of the site. I think next we're probably at, uh, and then elevations, as you can see, there are four residential levels and then a parking level that by the time you're at the top of the hill is, is uh, fully underground parking. Uh, next slide, uh, F4, I am not the architect for F4. Uh, the, uh, that's Dream Collaborative is the architect for this building and they couldn't make it tonight but I can give you a, a very quick run through of that as well. This is 37 home ownership units, six one bedrooms, 22 bedrooms and six three bedrooms. It has some kind of a mirror image of F2 with an entry uh, on the downhill side of it, right where those letters F4 are, uh, which is closest to Nubian Square. And then also another entry closer to John Elliott Square at the high point of the building. Uh, you can flip to the next slide. The existing context is similar as far as materials, but the context is a little more broken up on that side of the site. Uh, the buildings are smaller, uh, not a lot of coherent architecture, uh, which was part of the inspiration for this building. You can go to the next one. Uh, well, there's our entry, which, as I said, is sort of the mirror image for uh, F2. Uh, with the two important entry points this one because of the the uh where that parking arrow is basically there is a, a very secondary entry but it doesn't really have that kind of primary facade view that f2 did from the from the main site so we didn't need an entry at that location uh, next slide uh so the as i was saying the the context is very different so the the design driver on this building was to both climb up the hill, uh, climb up the hill with the uh, massing of the building. The parking is again also buried in this for most of the length of this building. This is really, I think, the primary entry of the building, but the massing's broken up into smaller pieces. That's more reflective of the smaller buildings that are the existing context at that at that uh, edge of the site. Uh, next slide. Uh, just another view, this is uh, back around in the driveway area, looking down towards the driveway. Again, uh, a lot of articulation, uh, very nice amenities, uh, balconies for the homeowners in the building. Uh, next slide, and that's looking down the hill towards Washington Street. So we're up at the, the highest point of this building is a point that's in the foreground. Uh, next slide. Again, some, well now some aerial views, that's uh, Lambert Avenue, 
to the that's going right left and then to the left is the uh, uh, Bartlett Street that goes right down to Washington Street you can see a lot of the context of the new construction along with existing context that's looking uh, aerial view looking at the main entry at the eastern southeast or northeastern corner of the building uh, next slide uh, this is looking from the west almost due west looking down in mainly on the right hand side into the interior of the of what would be the fully developed Bartlett site, even though most of what you see has, in that particular view, has not been built yet. Uh, this explains a slightly complicated parking program, but not a uh, huge interest. 22 of the parking spaces are within the footprint of F4, but three spaces are in the F3 lot and seven others are in the F5 lot, uh, again, for a total of 32 parking spaces for this development and there you can see the uh, four same idea of four residential levels it drops down to three levels at the main entry end of the building and then uh, uh, four residential levels and one uh, largely subterranean parking level and i think that might be it for f4 it is and i apologize for going longer than my time that's okay thanks cliff that concludes our presentation, and so we can proceed with the elements of the hearing accordingly, Mr. Vice Chair. Quick question of Cliff before we uh, move on, Dana, is um, the in the buildings you are the architect uh, of Cliff, is that brick, is that a veneer, or is that a, a brick that a bricklayer will put in? That is going to be real brick. It's, okay. not, it's not structural brick, but it will be right. full, full depth of veneer brick. Okay, it it had the appearance of that veneer type things those that you see out there, which I'm not very fond of. But uh, that's you all the rendering. The <laughs> rendering look that way. You and me both. I haven't seen it used very successfully. Yeah, very good. Okay, so before we uh, I ask the board if they have any questions, we'll take public testimony. If Tracer. you would like to testify, please raise your blue hand, and I will call on. I will ask you to unmute yourself. Mike Miles, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello. Good evening. Yes, good evening. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Mike. Great, great. Um, uh, first, respect to the board, the chair, the secretary, and all the board members and everyone in attendance. Um, as you said, my name's Mike Miles. I'm um, a part of the uh, project review committee and have been since the inception of this project. In fact, I was part of the Roxbury Strategic Oversight Master Plan Committee as the first chair. And I'm a lifelong resident and have been living in Roxbury for 90% of my time in Boston. Um, this project has been um, a long journey. And we're at a point where we really want to move forward. And as you saw from this presentation, the building design and the home ownership um, sort of plan is really about the opportunity for folks in the community to have a wealth generation home ownership opportunity, as well as to revitalize a site that's been dormant and uh, vacant for a very long time and bring activity back to the community that we very much need. Um, the, the, the issue around this project that has surfaced recently about the partnerships that the development team has developed, um, looking to move forward with, I think David addressed that with respect to having a very deep vetting process around that partnership and making sure it's appropriate to move forward. And, you know, frankly, I believe that the development itself, the planning, the, the building, as Cliff just outlined, doesn't change. That's really about a partnership that will make the financial aspect of this project move forward. So in that regard, I think that's an appropriate action for the development team to take since they have not been able to secure the ability to do that on their own they're looking for assistance and it doesn't change the actual development plan so what the community's vision was for this project remains the same and will be sustained through the pns agreement with that partner so that we get what we actually envisioned for the site um, you know what people say about partners are one thing 
but what they deliver is another, and I think that we should really be, you know, uh, sort of uh, keen on moving this project forward. So thank you for the stop sign. I'll stop there, but I just want to say I'm in, a, in support of moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Mike. Kayla Andre, unmute yourself. Taylor, you know, oh, great. Can you hear me? I, yep. We now can. we can, Taylor, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, one of the questions that I had was about if I'm coming to visit my grandmother who stays in the elders building, what does that mean as far as parking, um, residential parking stickers? Um, I, they just threw a sign up on Forest Street for residential stickers and didn't inform us. So I just want to know what does this look like um, as far as coming to visit or being a part of the neighborhood? Thank you, Taylor. I'm not sure who's uh, best to answer that question, Dana, but I imagine the public streets are public streets, but the pi parking lots are private property and there won't be any resident parking on, on the private property. I guess I'd ask, Dan, who do you feel is best to answer that question as far as permanent park? My apologies, Mr. Vice Chair. I was, uh, kept myself on mute because uh, our clock was going off and I didn't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, my sense is, David, if you and or Cliff could respond to that question, I th what I would say though, just from a general standpoint, and Taylor, it's a very uh, valid question. The, the, the parking that is being referenced in this action tonight is in relation to the buildings themselves. Mm -hmm. And so the, the the parking spots are going to be associated. Again, these are condos. So the residents who own, the, who are uh, living in the condos and our owners will likely have uh, right of first access, for lack of a better term, to those spots. Dana, I could add one, just one quick point. As part of the master plan, uh, for exactly this reason, all along the, the stretch of, of Lambert, Avenue and along Washington Street, the master plan gave up uh, a strip of, of uh, land, moved all the buildings in further in order to provide, uh, well, as well as uh, Bartlett Station Drive, the L-shaped road that, that winds through the site itself. Those are all public parking spaces. So the development of the site, I, sorry, I don't have the number, I'm not a civil engineer, but we provided many spaces where uh, they didn't exist before, uh, by giving up site area for it. Cliff, those future public streets, are you under, do you have any knowledge of whether the city is going to make them uh, resident permit parking? A excellent question. I, I don't know that, though. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I can always, I can, all you have to do is we, so, we can certainly take that under advisement, Mr. Mr. Monaghan. That's a, okay. a valid point for a future. Yeah. Thank um, you, Dana. Cliff. Trista? Yep. R.C. Smith, go ahead and unmute yourself. Good evening, everybody. Can you, uh, can you hear me all right? We can hear you yeah. fine, R.C. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is R.C. Smith. You just cut out, R.C. Hello? Can you hear yep, me? Just, you, you, oh, go ahead, R.C. All right, no problem. Um, I actually apologize. Uh, my name is uh not right on the on the record but uh i'm i'm, I'm uh, speaking on behalf of urban food and beverage uh, my name is farooq sahabdeen um, i'm the project and media manager of urban food and beverage uh, urban food and beverage operates two storefronts uh businesses in the roxbury area um so right off the bat we are in full support of this project um, there has been a fantastic community process in planning this project um, as illustrated uh, on this call tonight and we are also very pleased on the commitment uh, to filling over 60% of the construction jobs with uh, Boston workers of color uh, and to paying over 60% 60, 60 of those contracting dollars uh, to MBEs. Um, so again, on behalf of Urban Food and Beverage, uh, we are in full support of this project. Um, and I thank you so much for the time for allowing me to speak here this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Gary Walker, you can unmute yourself. Gary, 
Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, Gary Walker, electricians and technicians, Local 103, I'd like to speak in strong support of this project. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Title Team DJs, you can unmute yourself. Hello? Can Hello? Hello? Yeah, yes, fine. My name is, my name is Isaiah Gray. I'm, <laughs> excuse me, co-owner of Title Team DJs, local Boston business, and I call in support of the development going on over at Bartlett Yard. There's a lot of businesses um, throughout the years that New Estra and Wendell have supported. And so looking at their future plans and, and what they intend to do to help the community um, to, to bring in more employment as well as <clears throat> overall more housing to the community and helping with home home ownership, we have to be in support of that. So I urge your support and thank you for your, for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Minor Perez, go ahead and unmute yourself. Good evening, uh, Madam Secretary, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Minor Perez, on behalf of the Carpenters Union, I want to go on record on support of this project. I will uh, congratulate the developer for doing a good job, uh, for being civic engaged. Uh, I also, uh, I, I understand affordable housing is uh, uh, very needed in the city at this moment. I just want to echo um, the careers opportunity. Um, we definitely want to see good contractors um, work, uh, build this project where revenues um, are going back into the system so we can create more affordable housing. Also, we have many members, uh, many apprentices that can go and work uh, and enhance their career. It's a great opportunity to start a career. Hopefully there will be no people going into this project working and then after the project is done, they're gone and, and they're missing out on a great career opportunity to be able to retire with good pensions and health benefits. Um, that will conclude my remarks. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you, well said, Mayor. Vincent Coyle, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, hey, thank you, Chairman, and to the board and especially to the developer on putting uh, more housing in the city of Boston. Um, I hope you, you know, entertain um, a general contractor who supports community standards in the city of Boston, Boston, Boston plan. I know B and E project. Uh, there were some companies in there that weren't following the Boston. The Boston plan and sitting in these these back commissions that follow the employment of the project. Um, some of these projects, some of these contractors on site uh, didn't support uh, the Boston plan. They had bad numbers, uh, zero females on uh, with one contractor, very very minute um, members of the city of Boston. Uh, I just hope support uh, use a general contractor that supports community standards and a living wage. Um, it's a it's a nice nice spot. Uh, our members drive back. You heard the carpenters, the electricians. We have members that live in the city of Boston, and they're driving down Washington Street and they call the hall, you know, asking about the project and come to find out that they find out that we're not on the project. So hoping that you support the building trades, who uh, support the community standards and the Boston plan in the city of Boston. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vinny. I'm going to use this opportunity, Dana. I don't think the developer, I know, Cliff, you're the architect, but the actual developer, I'm not sure if the developer is on this uh, participating. Um, but I'll just ask the question, I guess, and I'd be curious sometime getting the answer from that developer. Um, in, as the th three speakers just spoke, we see in construction a lot, um, people might try and meet certain numbers that they're required to do. Um, in the uh, in the unorganized sector, you find people get paid differently with the same skill level. So I would ask the developer, regardless of race, divide, regardless of gender, people have the same skills. Will they be paid the same? So basically, an easier way to say it: Will women and men be paid the same? Will white and colored people be paid the same, performing the same jobs? And um, I would hope so. And that you know, moving. 
I, I can wait for that answer, but that's not as much a question, I guess it's much of a, a comment, and uh, I would hope that that would be the case. Mr. Monahan, I would, just to uh, interject, if you don't mind by doing this, mm -hmm. Nuestra CDC and Windell are the developers for this site. They are the landowners, so they would be responsible for okay. uh, for that particular piece. And the, 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 the sense also is, given your, your, your statement, that whoever should Nuestra and Wendell decide to bring on a partner, that they would that partner would also adhere to those standards. Yeah. But right now, for, for tonight's purposes, for the vote, Nuestra and Wendell are the developer because they are the site owner. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to continue with um, pu public testimony. We had someone who just called in to six to our phone number, and it was a bad connection. So if you wanted to testify that way, we urge you to call back, please. Karen Bunch. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, yes, good evening. Thank you uh, to the board. Uh, first of all, I just want to say I am a resident here in the area and I am here to support the project. I think it's a great opportunity to introduce more home ownership into the community. And also, as you know, <clears throat> affordable housing. Um, there's a housing crisis going on. So I think it'd be pretty awesome to uh, have some additional units and and also um, to support um, the, the local businesses here in the area. And I hope to see more in, uh, black and brown folks uh, out there on the project. So I do support the project and great job to the architect. Thank you. Thank you. Glenn Kelly, go ahead and unmute yourself. How are you doing? Good evening, everybody. I'm a local minority contractor and I did um, Worked recently and had the job in building E. I've done work over there in building E for Arnold Johnson. Um, he's a great guy to work with. And um, also, currently, I'm doing work in um, building B commercial space ongoing right now. And um, our firm, we do hire kids from um, trade schools, um, Youth Build Boston, um, to work with us on the job. And building E, we did have kids there from trade schools working over there from Youth Build Boston. And we also get kids from Madison Park as well to work on the site with us. And um, if the kids um, do good, we keep the kids and um, we, we give them jobs. And I totally support this project that's um, going on at the bottom over there. It's a great project and I think it's good for local businesses in the community to give them work and keep them busy. And I support the project 100%. Thank you, Glenn. Okay, Shell Antoine, you can unmute yourself. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, just um, again, as uh, Mike Antoine, Mike well stated, um, I'm in support um, of project, um, the revitalization of the site. I've, lived in, in the area and, and also attended high school and looking just a, a revitalization of the neighborhood. I am in full support. I also are happy um, that the process and the responses and the number of le uh, letters of support um, in for this project is uh, I'm deeply encouraged. I also am happy to see that a third, a third is fit in there. Uh, so I just wanted to say um, I am in support of it. And as a female worker um, who is a whole, um, business owner um, in the community, um, I look forward to um, seeing this great project continue. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Miles um, Ayum, Ayumu, sorry, I did a poor job with your last name, Miles. <laughs> Uh, good evening, Chairman and all the members of the board. Miles Yamu, I'm a local contractor in Dorchester. Uh, I work in the community and I support this project. If Windy Development is doing it, you know, maybe 80, 90% of the contractors on that job is going to be minorities, you know, and the workers are going to be minorities. So that is a big reason to support this project. Thank you. Thank you, Miles. Thank you. Is there anybody else who's who would like to testify? 
Connie, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi. Um, just to be clear, I heard earlier on that the developer has agreed to um, thoroughly vet the potential partner for this um, project. And since we've heard from them several times that they have currently uh, thoroughly vetted the proposed partner and they did not find all the issues that we found as a community, um, just want to verify that this partner is now after we found $150,000 they owed to the um, taxes for the city and they had more taxes on it, you know, credit tax they hadn't paid and that fiscally responsible, does this then make them no longer um, a viable partner for the project since we're finding that there is a lot of history of this partner that may not have been known and the community is concerned about also the workmanship that has been questioned. Just verifying that this partner is no longer being considered because of all the things that we brought to their attention. Thank you. Thank you. Dana, I'm not sure if uh, you're suited to answer that. That is for the development team to answer. Okay. Dana, you want me to uh, restate what our answer was? Yeah, please. Thank you. So we, we're committed to continuing and extending the vetting and due diligence process for the developer we've been talking with um, and to explore possible joint ventures and to not sign a purchase sale until that process and exploration are complete. So we, we're committed to continuing our process and considering all the issues and comments uh, not ending a process now. Thank you. Thank you, David. I, I understand the, uh, you don't mention any names or anything, but it, it seems to me that person that spoke is very well aware of a potential uh, partner. And I think maybe you are, are you people talking about the same partner? Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. We're all, we're all talking about the same development. Okay. Uh, okay. John Greeley has a, has a caller. John, do you want to go ahead? Thank you, Teresa. I'm going to put on Dorothea Jones. Hold on a second. Dorothea, you're all set. Go ahead. Yes. Good evening, everybody. I um, have been listening to everybody that is in support of this project, including um, one of the members of the uh, project review committee. And I have um, an objection to um, this project as um, it's been outlined, um, especially when it comes to um, the permanent jobs um, that are supposed to be on the project. And I would like to also have someone clarify outside of people purchasing a home what the um, wealth building is on this project. Um, we have been promised for um, a number of years that there would be um, um, commercial um, or retail at this project. Thus far, we have been told that there will be a school that is scheduled to open, a grocery store that is supposed to be coming to this particular site, um, and um, over with for the past um, five years, there has been no business development at this project. And in order for Roxbury to thrive, there has to be on each and every construction site when they, when they um, submit their proposal, they have to live up to the contract of that proposal so that there is um, business development on the site. And in addition, I want to, um, this is outside of the, um, the um, business aspect. I have to um, make a complaint about Mr. Monaghan referring to people as colored people. That Sorry. is such an ancient term and I find it pretty, um, pretty um, insulting that in this day and age, people of color are referred to as colored people rather than their um, um, 
ethnicity, ethnicity in terms of their cultural heritage and not on um, the fact that they may have melanin in their skin. Well, ma'am, I please accept my apology. I meant no harm by it, and um, and I'm sorry. I'll make a note of not to do that again. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Jones. I'm going to take Brian Keith now. You can unmute yourself. Good evening, board members. I just wanted to speak in support of uh, Nuestra and Windale on this project. Um, it has been going on for a very long time, and I think that we're finally at a point where we are ready to begin uh, putting this together and, and capping it off. So um, I'm excited to bring uh, people to this site and bring uh, more bodies to Nubian Square. Um, in addition, I want to add that the you know, the developer that uh, continues to be referenced. Um, they have been committed to this community for many, many years, um, building housing, um, but also bringing uh, amenities to Nubian Square, such as Dudley Cafe um, and other parts of the city. Um, so as a resident of uh, Nubian Square, I'm excited about this project and I'm very comfortable with uh, both sets of teams that are uh, currently uh, looking at this at this project. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Mount Pleasant Forest, and I can't read the rest. You can unmute yourself. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, many of those who are in support. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. You're a little broken up, but we can hear you. Hello? Uh, just want to make me. Okay, great. In a bubble because. Hello? Hello? We can hear Hello? you. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. OK, great. OK, I just wanted to say that many of those who are in, this, in support of this project are living in a bubble because they do not under, attend neighborhood association meetings, and they have not done their homework on the tactics that are being used on these and many other projects that proclaim affordability. Others will obtain financial gain, thus have a biased rationale with not and, and also are not sincere, sincerely caring about the robust community process that needs to happen and, and be taken into consideration of common good over self-interest. Nuestra leaves other properties in our neighborhood in a questionable state. Regardless of what the previous testimonies have been, the board must do their research before voting on this project. The mayor has stated that institutional racism will be addressed and this process is not in line with that statement. Roxbury residents will not build wealth if they will not get preferences, and that's a fact. The board needs to recognize its white privilege, which blinds them from understanding what is really happening here. So I propose that we really think about, I know it's been a long process, I know they've been waiting a long time, but Nuestra also has a lot of homework to do and a lot of work to do with their uh, previous properties. And so for them to be glorified in this manner is just abhorrent. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, can you give us your name? I don't think you did at the beginning. So I am the president of Mount Pleasant Forest and Vine. And mm -hmm. he has about 130. Um, you can just, um, David, let them know how many units you have in our, our um, neighborhood and our catchment area. But we've had continual problems with you and your properties and you not caring about real community and true community. You want to make sure that people who live in your residences are hold, beholden to you and not to community. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that that's understood with the board because the board doesn't live in Roxbury and the board doesn't understand what happens day in and day out. Thank you, ma'am. For the record, could you give us your name for the record? Oh, sure. I thought I did. Levette Tony. Okay. Thank you, Levette. 
John Greeley has someone else on the phone. John. Good evening, everybody. Hold on one second. Ma'am, we'll go ahead. You're live now. Hi. Um, good evening. The, um, the purpose of me um, talking tonight is um, I'm echoing. Let me shift. Yeah, this. if you just shut off your audio. Um, yeah, there you go. Okay. The purpose of me, um, am I still echoing? Yeah. Okay, should, should I shut it off or shut it off on my phone? Um, I think if you just shut off this, uh, um, I'm actually not sure how you're dialed in, but just do your best. That's okay. Right. Okay. Maybe I'll take you off the speaker. That might work. It sounds okay, a little bit better already. Okay. My name is Renette Taylor, and I've been a small business in the Roxbury area for 10 years. Um, my office is operated less than a mile from the shop. What I want to do is tell you a little bit about this job, this facility, this what it has done. I've been in the um, fire protection arena for over 30 years. I've been a, I was a union contractor up, to, up until 2012. Uh, now I'm open shop. But by having this development, what Nuestro and Wendell Development did is given me an opportunity to be a prime player. Now I have presently, I have a small business. I have 12 um, employees, six sprinkler fitters. 80% um, of my sprinkler fitters are people that live in this community and they're growing. And I really think that, uh, you know, without having people like Nuestra and um, Wendell, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. And then the other thing I need to talk to you about is the developer. Before all this happened, this developer gave me a chance to perform and execute what I can do. So without, you know, without the dude, he, he hired me as a contractor, not a woman, to perform and I did it. So I really think what Nuestra and Wendell did is make it possible for small minority contracts to build a resume about succeeding. So it's really important to hopefully with other future jobs that they can embrace and help um, bloom small contractors. You know, I did building B that was 60 units. I did the other building up on the hill and I got awarded to do building A. So Solomon, I mean, the people that are here, they really enforce supporting small businesses. So, uh, you know, I testify it's a really good opportunity and, um, so, you know, the developer that's potentially working, he, he gave, he's given me opportunities that I've never been able to get the opportunities. And right now in the city of Boston, there's a lot of work out there and the people do not look like us. But now yeah. in our community, they can say, hey, me too, I, I can do it. Thank you, ma'am. Your time is up. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, ma'am. We appreciate mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Have mm -hmm. a pleasant evening. Title team DJs has their hand up, but they've already testified. Um, and other than that, I don't see any other hands up. Anyone else would like to testify this evening, either in support or in opposition? Now's the last opportunity to do so. Okay, oh, and there was one. Um, there are, oops, Madam Secretary. Yes. If there are no other uh, there's one, Gregory Dwart. Well, it keeps going. I'm confused. Um, hold on. Gregory Duarte, are you trying to testify? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Hello. Uh, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, com committee members, uh, chairperson. My name is Gregory Duarte. Uh, and I'm a lifelong uh, resident of Roxbury. I'm a retired educator. And uh, I want to say I wholeheartedly endorse this project without reservation because of the obvious and much needed economic and social benefits for the community. Uh, there's an urgent need for jobs, quality housing, and home ownership, and just overall uh, vital economic uh, activity uh, that the project would would provide. Uh, the shortfalls have only worsened, um, you know, during this pandemic. 
I, I, I do believe this project would alleviate some of these conditions. My hope is that this proposal is approved and the project is underway without uh, any delay. And just a little background. I was, uh, I grew up in this neighborhood. I remember when that, that place was a, a, a barnyard for, for years and there was the hell over top. And, you know, um, there was development in that area, but it's been in a transitional state uh, for some time now. And, and I think this project has been up in the air. I think that the community uh, would benefit from it. Uh, the um, subs uh, and just individuals in terms of employment and just a, a moral uh, uh, boosting from, from this. So I, I, I support it without hesitation. And on behalf of Windale, uh, Crosswinds and Nuestra, I've only seen him do positive things in the in the uh, in this community over the uh, the time that uh, they come into uh, fruition. So again, I support it, and I look forward to it uh, being underway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I believe that concludes public testimony. Madam Secretary. Yes. There are some items that have come in that. I would probably, I would like to read into the record as appropriate. Yes, please. Great. Um, these, this is just a series of letters that have come in that, again, I'm going to read into the record uh, as part of the public hearing. The first is from Betty Tony. Dear Madam Chairwoman Rojas, on March 4th, 2021, the Roxbury Neighborhood Council and Roxbury United Neighborhoods held a community meeting with 55 attendees. The purpose was to allow the developers of apartment station and the potential investor, Solomon Charby, Shanti Acquisitions, to respond to the complaints, concerns, and questions of Roxbury investments, Roxbury residents, my apologies. Residents were disappointed and angered when Mr. and Mrs. Charby did not provide substantive answers, and the current developers appear dismissive of, trouble, of troubling Shanti's questionable business practices. The first set of questions focused on process and practices. The second set focused on approach and attitude. Both sets are critical to community engagement, safety, and welfare. All are elements embodied in the Roxbury Master Plan and Article 50. These documents developed by Roxbury residents and past mayoral administrations were, were to prevent unscrupulous and profiteering builders to devastate Roxbury by displacement and past and present blockbusting strategies. The Roxbury Neighborhood Council and the Roxbury United Neighborhoods are vehemently opposed to Solomon and Rokia Chaudhry Shanti acquisitions investing in any buildings or businesses at Bartlett Station. Thank you for your time and consideration. Betty Tony, Chair, Roxbury Neighborhood Council. The next is from Lorraine Payne Wheeler. Uh, I'll, read, I'll, read, I'll read this piece also. Um, opposition to developer Shanti selected by Northstar Community for phase five, buildings two and F4 at the Bartlett site. Crystal Rojas, chair of BPDA board, board members, staff, on behalf of my neighbors who have been negatively impacted due to uh, Projects by Shanti Development, I'm writing to express opposition to the Phase 5 development plan submitted by Nuestra Comunidad, requesting BBDA approval, and to add Shanti as the developer of buildings F2 and F4 in Nubian Square. In my neighborhood, I'm familiar with Shanti Development and, 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 and Solomon Charter because of their uh, project project proposal at 63 Perrin Street, 33 Copeland Street, where the abutters were sued. There are many complaints about this project, including that the abutters were not notified when uh, Mayor's Office of Limited Services or, organized the butter meetings. The lack of notification by Shanti Development caused two of other meetings to be scheduled. Lack of notice has happened on more than one Shanti project. Madam Secretary, this letter is fairly long. Um, I can read the full, thing, full content into the record, but the essence of the letter is in the paragraphs that I just read. I, I can continue or can pass it forward to, it has been received by the board already. So if it's if it is materially similar to the one that you just read, I'm okay with you sharing the name. Um, yes. Otherwise, you can read and work timing two two minutes. It's okay. Up to you, whatever you prefer. Great. I'll continue to read and let me know when my two minutes on this one is up. Okay. We'll do. There are dozens of completed projects in Boston that are similar to the 63 Perrin Street and 33 Copeland Street project with new condominiums constructed behind an existing historic house with driveway access available to all the condo owners. Instead of following a more conventional approach, this Shanti project was sub subdivided using an unsafe pathway to Copeland Street instead of the largest safe existing driveway behind 63 Barron Street as the entry to all the condos. The Copeland Street pathway is a very narrow and will not allow 
a few furniture delivery truck or fire truck to access the property. It is so narrow that an, like that a, an existing porch will be in the way of any cars using the pathway. Yet the plan has submitted for eight townhouses, townhouse owners to use the pathway and enter from Copeland Street. This is a complete failure. One would expect that the Boston ZBA board would, have, would deny a project when, so, when, when no hardship is discussed during the hearing and the project makes so little effort to follow Article 50 Roxbury zoning. The project at 63 Perrin Street, 33 Copeland Street was reviewed prior to the changes in the ZBA board brought about by the Sullivan. I will stop there. The next letter, bear with me just a moment. is from Representative China Tyler. On behalf of the constituents of the 7th Suffolk District and the community leaders who continue to express ongoing concerns, and I am concerned about the lack of due diligence involving the selection process by Nuestra Comunidad Community Development Corporation for the Phase 5 buildings at 2 and at 4 at the Bartlett Station site, because of that, I urge you to pause on this process and consider requesting the proper due diligence from Nuestra CDC. Corporations who build in Boston should be held to the same standards as we hold those who apply for housing. With that, I'm concerned that the serious legal issues were overlooked. Secondly, I would like to see more collaborative efforts to, to help grow the portfolio of Black, Latino, and developers of color. I'm seeing a pattern of many developers who value relationships within our community being overlooked. Oftentimes, I hear that it is because they don't have the capacity to complete the project at hand. This project is a flagship project that can help combat that issue. So. I hope that there is a second look taken at how Nuestra can partner with more than one developer to help address this issue. Thank you so much for your consideration, and I look forward to helping build a great community in Bartlett Station. Again, that's from Representative China Tyler, and those are the letters that I have. Great, thank you. Is there any questions, uh, further questions of uh, Dana or the developers? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? I'm sorry, I do have questions. Oh, there you go. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, my understanding is that uh, one of the buildings is going to be uh, designed by Dream Collaborative, um, which is uh, one of the few design firms in this part of the world where a majority of the principals, as far as I know, um, are uh, people of color and women. And I don't understand why they're not here. Why aren't they here? Dan, are you able to answer? My microphone Dave, was open, right? <laughs> yes, uh, that is a question for the development team. David, can you answer that, please? It, it, it's my understanding that they're out making presentations at other meetings they're obligated to be in. <laughs> And that, that's, that's my understanding, that, that they are valuable uh, parts of this proposal. They, they're actually the architects on another building at Bartlett, but uh, like a lot of up and coming companies, they're, they're busy. And they're, that's our understanding as to why they're not here tonight. Right, they, they may be busy, but they're, they're not a tiny firm. They've got about 20 people working there. So I, I just don't understand why when there's an opportunity uh, uh, to uh, have them step forward to shine in this uh, context, they're not here. And what that leads me to wonder um, is why it is that uh, so many of the um, details of this project are actually being presented to us by community people who've uh, done uh, clearly a fair amount of due diligence on this uh, rather than uh, being presented by you folks. So my question is, why have the negotiations with the community been so difficult? It's an excellent question. We've, we've had uh, five community meetings over the past three months, and we've responded uh, both at the community meetings and afterwards, we've done our research and responded in writing. And we feel like we've addressed a lot of the concerns. Uh, but probably not all of them. And some people have joined the conversation later and have not, I don't think, absorbed all the information. And that's why we thought it was a good idea to commit to extend the due diligence of vetting process to make sure we answer all the questions. 
um, both for the people who've been with us for three or four months and the people who just joined the conversation in the past month. So th that, that's why. But you, as you've heard, there's um, a difference of opinion in the community. And we think that when people have all the information, they'll, we, we're hopeful they'll end up supporting the project. Well, the difference of, differences of opinion are, are not uncommon in this process. Uh, but they're usually resolved through um, negotiations. And that's why uh, when this matter was on our agenda a month ago, uh, we decided to table it, which we don't do very often because it was our impression that good faith negotiations would then take place between the community and the development team. Um, and now we're at a point where we have a letter from the state representative saying, uh, that, that on behalf of her constituents, she's not satisfied that those negotiations not so much haven't been resolved, but, but that they don't seem to be producing uh, the kinds of outcomes that, that are um, acceptable to the community. And I, I, I uh, lived a few blocks from here for several years on Morley Street, so I know the site. Uh, I know what you've been through in terms of uh, getting this developed, um, and there's no one on this board who is prepared, uh, I think, uh, to vote against uh, home ownership and affordable housing uh, mixed in with market rate housing in Nubian Square at this point. Uh, but I, for one, find it very troubling uh, that um, key elements like who your partner is um, haven't been disclosed by you, but have been disclosed by the community. Um, and, and that the community's disclosure um, raises questions. I don't know how substantive those objections are, because we haven't heard. Um, but I do find it very troubling uh, that issues around financial viability, sustainability of the buildings, uh, track record in terms of employment and hiring, um, still haven't been resolved in a way where our state rep uh, sends us a letter um, saying that, that further questions need to be resolved. So my question to you is, uh, is this uh, program, as much as we want this housing to take place where it is, is this program ripe for a vote of this board? I would say certainly the program is ripe for a vote, that the program is going to happen regardless of who the developer is. We've agreed to continue the vetting process. We did disclose the developer starting back in November. So we've been as transparent as possible. This is not new information to the community. And I think we just have to process the information and our responses more. But the pro we really need the program approved tonight. And we've agreed to extend the process uh, for discussing the developer with the community and, and to address the state representative's concerns. Okay, well, you understand that in, in projects of this type, you may be back before this board. Yes. So whatever we vote is a message that you may be back. That's correct. Yeah. As long as you have that understanding. Yes, sir. <laughs> Any further questions? Hearing none, was the pleasure yeah, I'm, of the board. I'm sorry, Mr. Monahan, for the mm -hmm. interruption. Um, and Madam Secretary, please correct me if I uh, am misstating. There is a, there are a number of letters that were sent. Uh, there were form letters. Um, the, 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 the context to which I'd like to read into the record and just articulate that, that we had well over 100 names who submitted. I think that that satisfies, I think that's satisfactory. Yeah. Okay. I'll just read the letter into the record just for the sake of uh, continuity. And, and before you start, I just, I want to, there are a number of people who have raised their hands. Public testimony has, has been okay. completed, um, just so that I, 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 everybody's aware. Go ahead, Dana. So the letter, uh, as, as submitted by uh, a number of individuals, reads, uh, my name is, name, uh, residing at, address given. I'm writing to express my support for the development of lots F2 and F4 at Bartlett Station proposed by Nuestra Comunidad and Windale developers. The development of these lots will bring 65 much needed units to a much 
uh, units of market rate and affordable housing to Roxbury residents, employ minority owned contractors and local workers of color and bring more buying power to the Nubian Square Main Streets district, all contributing to the master plan and vision for the, the development of Barton Station. I'm also writing to express my support for Soumon Chaudhry and Yorkeo Begun of Shanti Acquisition as a developer who will acquire lots F2 and F4 and, and execute the master plan for Barton Station. As Roxbury residents themselves and the owners of operators of Dudley Cafe and Shanti restaurants. Solomon and Rokia are not only personally invested in the success of, and vitality of Nubian Square, but also have a strong track record of responsible business ownership and job creation for local residents of color through the development and preservation of housing units in the city of Boston. Rokia and Solomon have demonstrated their commitment to creating home ownership opportunities for their neighbors and build general wealth. Great, thanks, Dan. <clears throat> are there any further questions? Well, I, I want to ask Mr. Landsmark, are you suggesting that it might make sense to table this project again? Is that what you were suggesting? Uh, if it were up to me, I would table it with an understanding that there'll be a vote at the uh, next meeting with an expectation that um, answers to the questions which have been raised um, will uh, be available to us. Um, at that next meeting and that um, the uh, parties enter into um, real due diligence um, and real conversations uh, that uh, don't put this board in a position where it has to vote against uh, the kind of community opposition that we're seeing uh, to this project. I, I see feel, the community support, and 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 I'm I'm in. I, I believe that this project should proceed, but I also see that there are some issues that need to be resolved. But, but, uh, Mr. Landmark, if I can interject with a, a question, um, the consideration around the proposed project and Westra and Windale as the again landowner. Um, their, their ability to move the project forward. The, the, the vote we would, I, I guess, let's say the vote we would, that would be proposed would, would, is not for, it is not in relation to a proposed developer or proposed partner. Um, it is focused specifically on the, the proposed program and the design, et cetera. Um, just wanted to maybe reiterate that and, and clarify, um, because that, that, that seems to be within, I, I think, the, the purview of, of, of where we are now. I, I, I personally don't see much change. I'm not aware of any outstanding questions. I think they've addressed them. Between the ZBA and the BRA, I have over 20 years experience where there's certain projects that are never going to meet certain people's um, satisfaction. And uh, the, the project is before us. We've untabled it uh, just earlier. And uh, my personal opinion is I think discussions can still continue, uh, but we can vote tonight to move this project forward. It doesn't mean discussions stop. What, what, I, would, what I would also, my apologies, Mr. Monaghan, for what I would also reiterate is that the development team has articulated a commitment to the representative to uh, not move forward with any agreements until such time uh, with a potential partner until such time as they have resolved and answered issues around due diligence looking at feasibility and also considering uh, aspects of a potential joint venture so the project program itself regardless of who the development partner is would move forward but the it is the onus is on the development team to follow through on that commitment that they have made to the representative regarding those three components of further work that needs to be done understood yeah, Dana I, I I do appreciate hearing that from you I wish that I'd heard it from the developers so are there any further questions Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs. Aye. Dr. Lansmark. Abstained. Mr. Miller. 
Aye. And I'm voting in favor of the motion. The motion passes. Thank you. Um, from what I understand, before we take into the development piece of the next project, Councilor Bach and Councilor Flaherty, I believe, uh, Flynn, sorry, uh, are on the line and they'd like to be heard and we'll take them out of order at this point. So, Teresa or Jonathan, can you um, yep. facilitate that? Councilor Excuse Flynn, me. go ahead. Yeah, I've got to recuse myself from this one. Okay. Uh, for the record, uh, Mr. Miller is recusing himself. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, Vice Chair and, and, and Director Golden. Um, with your permission, may I speak on um, number 15 and also on the Beacon project relating to the Pine Street Inn? Certainly. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, on, on project number 15, I'm speaking on behalf of myself and uh, Council Michael Flaherty. Um, I'm here to voice my support for the notice of project change for the proposed development at the Ray Flynn Marine Park. This project is important for the economic prospect of the Flynn Marine Park, as it will bring businesses, activities, and well-paying jobs in the area, making the area more prosperous and attractive. This NPC would still allow the development to be suitable for the marine industrial designation for the site and will allow the project to move forward. I hope that the BPDA will uh, consider approving this NPC. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Mr. Chair, may I continue on the, um, the Pine Street Inn project? Oh, please do. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, uh, Vice Chair and Director Golden, I'm in writing, I'm, I'm speaking in support of the Beacon Company's project proposal um, this historic YMCA Boston uh, property, which will maintain a mix of residential, commercial, educational, cultural use on the site, including the well-loved uh, theater. The plan also includes covering the 66-room hotel and 118 apartments into 212 affordable studio in one bedroom apartment. In partnership with the Pine Street Inn, as a service provider. The, pro the proposed project will serve 111 formerly homeless households with heavily service enriched programs. In addition to Beacon Residential Management, Health and Wellness Program and services. Um, Beacon and the proposed service enriched housing will help achieve significant progress toward key city and state goals of expanding service enriched housing options for Bostonians, preserving uh, city institutions and manufacturing diversity in the Back Bay area. In, in the context of COVID-19, this development will also address housing needs for those most vulnerable and impacted by the on ongoing pandemic. I believe the project will be a valuable addition to my district and um, and I know the development team has conducted a thorough community process. I hope that the BPDA will look favorable on this project. If you have any questions, um, thank you, Mr. Chair and um, Vice Chair and Director Golden as well. Thank you, Council Flynn. Thank you. And uh, Teresa or Jonathan, are you, uh, is Councilor Bach? Yes, Councilor Bach is, is on and I think prepared. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, I wanted to join today. This is in Councillor Flynn's district, but it's immediately adjacent to mine. Um, and I think it really reflects a deep desire that uh, the Back Bay residents that I represent have had to get more affordable housing in the neighborhood. And frankly, the last time that I was here speaking before you all, it was about our affirmatively furthering um, fair housing uh, zoning changes, which are gonna go into formal effect next week. Um, and as I said then, one of my major goals was to think about how we make sure that we have places for all Bostonians to live in all parts of the city. Um, and I think that kind of inclusive housing is really being served by this proposed project that's before you today, um, a, a collaboration of Beacon Communities and Pine Street Inn. Um, and it, you know, it means a lot to me. I, uh, I, before becoming a counselor, worked at the Housing Authority and actually worked around the policy change that made it possible to project-based more vouchers around the city. Um, in a financially sustainable way. 
And this is a situation where we've got the prospect of um, of putting 200 of those, 211, I think it is, of those um, uh, opportunities for low-income Bostonians to live in our city right on site, right in the heart of a transit-rich area, a few steps from the Boston Public Library, Central Branch, um, all of the wonderful parks and amenities and job opportunities and educational opportunities um, that I'm so proud to have in my district and Councillor Flynn's um, right in this place of cultural heritage um, with the Lyric Theater being so important to all of us. I just think um, it's an amazing opportunity and uh, and it's it's even it even provides a continuing space for part of the campus of our Snowden High School. Um, so I think it's an unusual coming together of things um, and uh, for me, I, I grew up in Bay Village, so very close to this, um, and I grew up around the corner from supportive housing units that are now managed by Caritas Communities um, that my, uh, my parents and their friends have been involved in siting in their neighborhood uh, 30 years prior. And, um, and to me, those have always sort of shown as an example of how supportive housing for low-income folks can be a part of the neighborhood. Um, can be part of a great neighborhood. Um, and I know that sometimes people worry about what it means to have formerly homeless folks living nearby. Well, it means that people who didn't have housing now have housing. Um, and uh, and that's really, you know, what unhoused folks are, is they're people who are, who are lacking a thing that we all need. Um, and so I'm just really grateful to the Pine Street Inn for all their work and the idea of really being able to anchor a bunch of people in place in, in the neighborhood um, means a ton to me. Uh, and and I hope, um, I hope we'll compel um, the board today. I, I also just wanna briefly thank um, the Beacon team for being responsive to, uh, I know my constituents have, we're, we're really glad to see the historic preservation aspect of this project, have also pushed on the green aspects of this project um, and, uh, and Beacon's really recently upped their commitment to go from um, sort of complying with LEED to LEED Silver. And you know, there's more work to do. I think we're all looking at decarbonization and, and what we could do with our legacy historic buildings and I I wouldn't say we're at the top of the um, at the top of the range here with this project on that but I do want to recognize that in response to um, you know some uh, comments and pressure and conversation around that front that the team came to the table and has made real strides on that so as, as the counselor as a counselor who always wants to be both for green sustainability and for um, affordable housing I, I appreciate the ability to kind of hold both those things. So I, I've definitely gone over my time, but uh, thanks, thank the board for their forbearance and uh, thank you to all, the team and all of the um, community members who have engaged in this process. Um, thanks. Thank you, Council. Okay, <clears throat> for the re reading to the record, item 22, request authorization to adopt a report and decision on the 140 Clariton 121A. Chairman Monaghan, you need yep. to read the script the, the virtual hearing script like we did similarly previously? Yep. So, um, okay. So, you mean thank you for joining the match? No, this is a public hearing before the Boston Redevelopment Authority. Okay. I have it here somewhere, Teresa. I have it. Hold on. This is a public hearing before the Boston Redevelopment Authority doing business as the Boston Planning and Development Agency being held in conformance with Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 121A in the Acts of 1960. Chapter 652 is amended to consider the proposed project at 140 Clarendon Street in the Back Bay neighborhood of Boston. The project involves a renovation of the existing YWCA building consisting of approximately 50,000 square feet of existing hotel and residential uses into affordable housing units and supporting programs, all of which will be income restricted to households at or below 60% of the area medium income. The hearing was duly advertised on February 25th, 2021 in the Boston Herald. This is a P BPDA hearing on a proposed petition by the agency. Staff members will first present their case and are subject to question by members of the agency. Thereafter, anyone who wishes to testify about the proposed project will be afforded an opportunity. We have taken support and opposition at the same time. If you are planning to testify, please take time now to verify that your computer microphone is active 
click the hand icon on your Zoom control panel. This will signal staff that you would like to speak. When your hand is raised, it will be blue. If you are calling into the meeting, would like to testify, please dial star nine to raise your hand. When I call for all testimony, staff will announce your name and allow you to talk. You must unmute your microphone. Your webcam will not be active. In an effort to accommodate all who would like to speak about this proposal, each person will be given up to two minutes to comment. BPDA staff will indicate when 30 seconds remain. At that time, please conclude your remarks so that the hearing may continue and others may be heard. At the conclusion of all oral testimony, any email testimony will be read aloud. Finally, the proponents are allowed a period of five to 10 minutes for rebuttal if they do desire. Request authorization to adopt a report and decision on the 140 Clarendon, Clarendon 121A project in Back Bay under Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 121A in the Acts of 1960. Chapter 652 as amended to issue a scope and determination waiving the requirement of further review pursuant to Article 80B, Section 80B 5.3D of the Zoning Code for the construction of approximately 210. Apartments, 60% of medium income restricted housing units, health and wellness amenities, and offices in partnership with the Pine Street Inn. Subject to continuing design review, the existing ground floor commercial use of the Lyric Stage of Boston Theater in the Snowden International School will remain unchanged and to take all related action. Newport? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Members of the board, Madam Secretary, Director Golden, I'm Nupur Monani, Senior Institutional Planner and Project Manager. I'm pleased to share with you a proposal by Beacon Communities to create 210 income-restricted housing units in Back Bay through the renovation of the existing YWCA building at 140 Clarendon Street. Um, if you could advance to the next slide. As the councillors alluded to um, in their remarks at the beginning of this agenda item, the proposed project presents an opportunity to add housing in a transit rich location at the heart of Back Bay while preserving a historic building and most importantly, creating a safe space to live for some of Boston's most vulnerable residents. All of the proposed 210 apartments will be income restricted to households at or below 60% of the AMI. Of those, 111 will be set aside for individuals or families experiencing homelessness and be managed in collaboration with the Pine Street Inn. Pine Street and Beacon will offer wraparound social services for those households, including on-site case management, social activities, and access to job training services as well. Could you go to the next slide, please? The building currently has a handful of commercial uses on the ground floor, the Lyric Stage of Boston Theater, an annex for the Snowden International School, and two small businesses, all of which will be preserved as part of the renovation. No exterior additions are planned to the nearly 100-year-old structure, but exterior repairs such as brick repointing will be undertaken in accordance with the standards set by the US Secretary of Interior. The review process for this project began late last year with a PNF filing in January 2021. Following this, the BPDA held two very well attended community meetings. Beacon Communities has worked with the BPDA, other city departments involved in this project, local elected officials, the impact advisory group, and the community at large to actively listen to and address concerns related to the project, its design, safety security plans, and sustainability approach. In addition, Beacon is also presently working with existing tenants to minimize displacement as part of this renovation. As alluded to by Councillor Bach, the staff also appreciates in particular the work of Beacon and New Ecology on pursuing a LEED Silver certification to meet the city and BPDA sustainability goals. In addition to Councillor Flynn and Bach voicing their support for the project tonight, we have also received letters of support from Councillor Andrea Campbell, uh, State Representative Santiago, Representative Livingston. Local, local organizations supporting the project include Neighborhood Association of Back Bay, Women's Lunch Place, the Back Bay Association, Trinity Church of Boston, and the Lyric State of Boston, which is one of the existing uses in the building. 
In conclusion, I would just like to say that this project advances the BPDA's goals for equitable housing creation, sustainability and resilience, and thoughtful historic preservation, and has the potential to be precedent setting for our city. I will now turn it over to Darcy Jameson and Lindia Downey from the Beacon and Pine Street Inn teams to go through the presentation. Afterwards, we will be happy to take any questions from the board or members of the public. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me? Now we can. Okay, great. If you could advance it to the next slide, please. Great. Um, so I'm Darcy Jameson with Beacon Communities. And on behalf of Beacon and the Pine Street Inn, I want to express our thanks for everyone's collaboration over the last couple of months, the BPDA, the city, the community, all the departments. Um, I'm joined tonight by the leadership team from Beacon and Pine Street Inn, Howard Cohen, Dara Covell, Ben Phillips, Lindia Downey and Jan Griffin, as well as some of our consultants and technical team led by Nitty John from our architect, Krowitz Chalinski. And I'd also like to acknowledge our partner, Bruce Persiloy with Mount Vernon Company. Um, so we're here tonight to talk about, as Newport said, a really exciting opportunity at 140 Clarendon Street. It's been home to the YWCA since the building was constructed by them in the early 1900s. Um, just by way of brief background as to how we got here today and why the rush, the YW had a market rate hotel buyer lined up last year to acquire the building, which um, would have displaced everyone that was there. And with the onset of COVID, that sale dissolved and opened up an opportunity for Beacon, the city, the state, and Pine Street and to really think big about what we could accomplish together and that would really have a citywide impact. The outcome of those conversations are what we're here to talk about tonight. Um, and Newport, um, yeah. So historic preservation, as Newport mentioned, um, of the building, uh, retaining the cultural and educational uses that are in the building, and I think most significantly, the creation of 210 permanently affordable studio and one bedroom apartments, 111 which will be set aside for people who are currently experiencing homelessness and supported by the Pine Street Inn through their housing first model, which Lindia will spend a couple of minutes talking a little bit more about in a couple of minutes. The same condition that led us to this opportunity is also driving our schedule. The YW needs to effectuate the sale no later than August. Um, and in order for Beacon to accomplish that, we need to put our financing and approvals into place um, over the near term to continue our process with the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So we really appreciate everyone's um, help and support getting us here tonight. Um, so I think, uh, Newport, if you want to advance to the next slide or whoever's controlling them, I think that most folks know Beacon, but we are a Boston-based, mission-driven affordable housing development and property management company. We own about 150 communities with over 17,000 apartments. Please advance. Um, and just by way of a couple of examples of communities in the Boston area that Beacon owns and manage, we have Quincy Towers in Chinatown and the Old Colony Public Housing Redevelopment in South Boston. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd like to turn it over to Lindia for a few minutes to talk about Pine Street Inn's housing first model, and then I'll take everybody through the rest of our program. We have Lindia or Jan, would you like to? Sure, I can um, jump in. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, Pine Street Inn is well known for our emergency shelters, but at this point in time, we're very proud that we actually have more housing units, more units of housing than shelter beds. Um, to state it um, simply, housing is, uh, is the solution to homelessness. So we're very excited about the 140 Clarendon project. Um, the center panel in this slide talks about our supportive housing um, and our rapid rehousing and, and um, placement. That's what we're all about. It's, it's about moving people off the streets, out of emergency shelter and into housing. Next slide, please. These are just six pictures of Pine Street Inn properties um, in Boston and Brookline, just that so you could see 
um, the quality of our development. Um, Beacon has extraordinary quality in terms of their developments. Um, the key to being a good neighbor, we feel, is having our properties be the best looking properties on the street. Um, and so that's what we strive for. And um, again, these are just some samples of Pine Street in owned housing. Next project, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so Pine Street Inn's impact um, is multifaceted. And one of the things that we all can agree on is that um, a, a better Boston is a Boston without homelessness. So the goal for the city is to get to a functional, what's called a functional zero in terms of homelessness, which means we're not there yet, but if somebody becomes homeless, then it's just a matter of a very short period of time before they're moved into housing. The way that is going to happen is projects such as 140 Clarendon with 111 units of targeted housing for homeless people, um, the, the increase to the overall Boston housing stock, again, targeted to homeless people, really takes a big jump with this project. And that's, we're so excited about that. And it will really impact the lives of people who are living on the streets and living in our shelters. So the goal is less shelter use, more housing, and we're just thrilled to partner with Beacon for that goal. Um, thank you, Jan. Next slide, please. Um, I'd like to spend a minute on Beacon Residential Management and our community relations and safety. Safety was one of the main concerns that we heard from the community during the community process that Newport referenced. Um, to start, Beacon and Pine Street Inn will have an extremely strong presence in the building as well as in the neighborhood. Both Beacon and Pine Street Inn will have a team of people on site, our full-time property management team, our maintenance team, our resident services coordination team, as well as Pine Street Inn's um, case management team. So on any given day, probably somewhere between eight and 20 staff people coming in and out and throughout the building. We'll also have two full-time 24 seven security officers on site. And, com and we've committed to the community in some of our early conversations that we're ready to begin participating in neighborhood community safety meetings whenever um, folks would like to, to have us start participating. The other thing I wanna to touch on you know, that came up during the meetings is tenant selection. The tenant selection process has been developed in close coordination with the city of Boston's housing policies and the Boston Housing Authority, as well as understanding and considering all fair housing requirements. And we've adjusted some of this based on the community feedback that we received. Um, collectively, our goal is to accommodate residents who have experienced barriers to permanent supportive housing and provide the housing and services to help them succeed. That said, there are a few exceptions. No exceptions will be made for non-citizens, level three and or lifetime sex offender registrants, those convicted of production of methamphetamine and federally assisted housing, and applicants whose patterns of behavior are deemed to pose a threat to the community. Beacon and Pine Street will work together to assess the needs of applicants for the Housing First program and make smart, appropriate determinations to meet our goals. Can we flip to the next slide, please? So this slide just briefly augments some of what I've been talking about in terms of the programs and services that um, Jan mentioned that Pine Street Inn will offer through their housing. First, the wraparound case management programs and services. And then the Beacon Residential Management Team also has a community engagement team that will have on-site wellness programs, coordinate visits from medical professionals, our fitness center, and other programs and services. Next slide, please. So just coming back to the building specifically for a minute, we've talked a little bit about the current uses, the existing cultural and educational uses, plus Vega and the Hanovan Taylor. And in addition, there are 79 existing affordable apartments um, and 39 market rate units um, of about which 15 are occupied right now and the shuttered hotel as a result of COVID. Um, next slide, please. 
So I think we've talked pretty, pretty generally about what the program is, but for the historic building, no changes to the facade, 210 apartments serving households below 60% of the area median income that we anticipate will be fully supported by project-based vouchers from the Housing Authority, um, serviced and enriched by Beacon and Pine Street Inn. And I just want to touch on parking since I know that's always a question. There are four existing parking places that our staff will have access to. No additional parking is proposed and um, not a population that we would um, anticipate actually would have too many vehicles anyway. Um, next slide, please. So I want to just briefly touch on our scope of work, which includes, um, as Newport said, some repairs to the historic facade and then common area improvements. Um, the building went through a renovation by the Y about 15 years ago. So it's actually in pretty, pretty decent shape, though like any aging building um, does need some work throughout the building. Um, the, I think the biggest scope of work is adding kitchens to all of the hotel rooms and New, and single room occupancy units in the building and all the associated ventilation systems so that every apartment is a standalone apartment. Next slide, please. Um, so we've been working very closely with the city and state housing agencies to balance the multiple social and physical uh, redevelopment goals within the existing framework that the building is occupied. Um, it's historic um, work needs to be done with, in accordance with the secretary of the interior. Um, and the financial resources that are available and compressed closing schedule. And, and I appreciate a Councillor Bach's uh, remark that we have been trying to, to listen and be responsive and uh, improve some of our um, redevelopment plans around the green aspects. So just really briefly, I think folks know it's, we're in a transit rich environment. We are making significant improvements to the accessibility getting into the building and then throughout the building. Next slide, please. Um, and then from an environmental standpoint, it's an existing building, so there are no new impacts around, you know, storm water, utilities, um, wind, et cetera. And we are making very significant, I think, improvements on the sustainable design side. Um, the building will achieve LEED Silver certifiable, and I know that folks have asked us to consider whether or not we can even go further than that. We appreciate the questions from GBC um, as well as the community, and we'll definitely continue to explore what the opportunities are. But as I mentioned, there are some variables related to the fact that the building's occupied, historic, um, and financial um, resource considerations. Um, but that said, we're happy to continue the dialogue to see what might be possible. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So uh, relocation, so the good news is that the cultural, educational, and commercial uses that we all love will be able to remain in the building. Um, there are 79 affordable apartments and those residents will be uh, able to stay in the building. We may, we will probably be moving them around as we sequence our construction throughout the building, but we're working closely with our relocation partner, who many of you know, Housing Opportunity Unlimited to work closely with those residents to make sure they get to know our team now um, and understand what's ahead. Um, I attended a meeting with them recently and it's a nice group that we're gonna have an opportunity to get to know and um, make sure have permanent homes in the building. And then there are market rate residents. Um, I think we're down to about 15 market rate residents right now. I heard recently a couple people had moved, moved on. Um, there have been questions about um, why the market rate residents um, are being um, asked to relocate. Um, and, you know, this really stems from um, a little bit related to the economics. Um, it, this is a tax credit project. And so without getting into too much detail, um, for every apartment that is not a tax credit apartment, we lose some of the upfront capital to the tune of about $150,000, about $100,000. Um, and then by just maintaining just a handful of market rate apartments in such a large building, um, there are some ongoing challenges often with releasing um, those. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. We're happy to talk more about it um, if folks have questions. And then last but not least, um, 
I just want to touch on construction. Um, once um, we transition into ownership of the building, it'll be about a 20 month construction period. We'll really focus on Beacon's offices and the wellness spaces on the first floor. Um, very focused on communication with residents so that folks know what go is going on. Hopefully COVID will be a distant memory, but if it's not, it will be top of mind for our safety practices. We're currently working on a construction management plan. We had a public improvement commission meeting this morning that went well. We're working on our CMP and all the associated documents. And just in my closing remarks, I just want to acknowledge that we're very mindful of the WMBE Section 3 Boston job requirements and will ensure that we and our contractor are in full compliance with those. I'm going to stop there and look forward to questions. Very good. Thank you, Darcy. Are there any questions of the board? Actually, let's take public testimony first. Okay. Chair Monaghan. You going to um, facilitate and, that again? Yep. So, and anybody who wishes to to testify either in support and opposition, please um, please uh, activate your blue hand. Martin Roder, go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the board, uh, the BPDA, and uh, elected officials, uh, if you're still online. Um, so I, I actually represent a group of residents uh, of the Back Bay, the ones that Councillor Bock referred to, who um, had, uh, had a discussion with the project team, and we are pleased that they took the small steps announced in a filing, I think on March the 8th, uh, to, move to, uh, to move to Leeds Silver. Um, we, of course, support and welcome this project, which uh, I think many people in the Back Bay have long advocated for, to have affordable housing uh, in this very attractive, well-known neighborhood. However, having said that, I think we would be remiss if we did not identify the predictable financial and reputational risks which this building may well face within a very few years because uh, even with the modification of the proposed case in the PNF, it will in fact fall far short, or because it only involves a relatively modest improvement in building carbon emissions, fall short of the goals of the policies and the standards for this critical element in the ongoing battle to contain threats from climate change that are being formulated by both the city and the Commonwealth and will certainly come into effect in the near future. Uh, the risk, the financial risk, is that the building will be required to make a substantial additional investment, which could potentially be avoided a few years from now, to decarbonize more aggressively. And reputationally, it may end up being a relatively um, a high carbon island. So we respectfully propose two parallel complementary efforts steps towards implementing the REACH scenario, which achieves a 50% reduction as compared to an 8% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in the PNF, and pursuing additional financial facilities in addition to those already being targeted. Um, the steps could be terminating the existing steam contract with the Synergy Energy, modifying the air source heat pump component of the REACH case to utilize the existing water source heat pump. And there are other uh, aspects. Uh, of Martin, your, your time is up, Martin. Can I just respectfully say that we urge the project to be approved with the recommendation that there be a continued investigation of the feasibility of implementing this REACH case. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Kathleen Young, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi. Um, I'm here as a representative of the Homelessness Task Force of the Neighborhood Association of the Back Bay. Um, and I thank you for your work in making sure our city is beautiful and vibrant and a wonderful place where all residents can live in dignity. I, I just want to give you a little background on what we were involved in. There are 17 members of this task force that came together in the Back Bay, part of the Neighborhood Association, we're officially part of the Neighborhood Association, which has supported the project. And they came together because of safety concerns of people living on the streets. And then it quickly rose to concerns about the dignity of people and life in our city. 
and these neighbors have studied and um, the problem of homelessness and this model that's about to be employed at 140 Clarendon is the model that will turn out to be a national example. So I am very much supportive of having this move forward as expeditely as possible. And, um, and I do think they have um, a lot of resources that have to be invested to make it successful um, working with this very vulnerable population. So I appreciate your fast tracking the project and um, I'm looking forward to our neighborhood having this project in our midst and of the 17 members of our homelessness task force are abutters and neighbors and they're very excited about having this come come into our neighborhood so thank you very much thank you Kathleen Minor Perez go ahead and unmute yourself thank you madam secretary mr. chairman members of the board of minor Perez on behalf of hundreds of union members that live in the world across the city of Boston want to go on record in support of this project also want to give uh, uh, a shout out to Darcy, Jamison, Beacon Communities, and Mount Vernon Group for pulling this uh, deal together uh, and their civic engagement was exceptional. Uh, and lastly, great thanks to Jan Griffin. Uh, she's an angel. She does a great job running Pine Street Inn, and we definitely need more angels like her. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Nancy Armstrong, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, my name is Nancy Armstrong. I'm the Director of Operations at Women's Lunch Place, a shelter for women experiencing homelessness and poverty on Newbury Street. We strongly support this project. Beacon Communities and Pine Street are organizations highly regarded for their expertise, development, and management of affordable housing. We are impressed with the oversight that has been built into this project. The programming, stabilization, services, security and staffing levels forecast a safe, well-run and much needed community. I urge you to vote in favor of this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Ronald um, Sudal, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello, I'm Ron Sudal. I am the uh, president of the board of directors of the Lyric Stage Company of Boston, which leases uh, space for its theater in the building. And in addition to that, I am a member of the, uh, I live in the neighborhood, uh, just around the corner on Columbus Avenue in the South End. Uh, I'm, I'm very much in favor of this project as a uh, member of the neighborhood. And as a spokesperson for the Lyric Theater, uh, I, I, I want everyone to know that we have worked very closely with the incoming owners uh, to work out details of extending our lease and maintaining our uh, excellent position in the theater. Um, our theater is a, a wonderfully intimate space and um, we want to preserve it as such and we believe that we will be able to do so and uh, have a better relationship with the community as a result of occupying this um, re-envisioned space. Thank you. Thank you, Ronald. Patricia Corrigan, go ahead and unmute yourself. Good evening, my name is Patricia Corrigan and I am here speaking on behalf of the Neighborhood Association of the Back Bay, of which I am currently president, in support of this project. As you've heard from Martin Roter, who also is of the Neighborhood Association of the Back Bay, as well as Kathleen Young, who spoke on behalf of the Homelessness Task Force, um, we are highly in favor of this, this affordable housing project. Um, as you know, NAV is deeply committed to affordable housing, community engagement, preservation of the architectural integrity of the Back Bay, and sustainability. And to that end, the 140 Clarendon Street project checks those boxes in four significant ways. First, with the addition of several hundred deeply affordable units with approximately one half to two thirds of the units prioritized for the chronically homeless, the project will make a major contribution in meeting critical housing needs, which we as at NAV have long advocated for here in the Back Bay and in our city. We stand behind the supportive housing model where full-time staff provide services to sustain residents' health and well-being for formerly chronically unhoused persons. 
We feel confident with the partnership with the Pine Street Inn, which has an established track record of success with this innovative housing first model. Second, in our review of the proposal, we understand that the developer has an established track rec record of success. Third, the construction plan for this uh, project is consistent with NAV's efforts to preserve and protect the architectural integrity of Back Bay buildings. And fourth, within the confines of budgetary constraints within an existing 100 year old building, developers working to meet sustainability goals and requirements. All this is to say NAB fully supports the proposed project, which address, addresses social policy goals, most, important for, most importantly for affordable housing at 140 Clarendon Street. Thank you for this opportunity to be heard and we are happy to assist in any way that we can. Thank you, Patricia. Vincent Coyle, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hey, Vincent Coyle, business agent with the Iron Workers of Local 7. Uh, who's a strong supporter of Pine Street Inn. Uh, rise in favor of this project, especially helping those um, that are on the streets, having hope and uh, finding a place to live. Thank you. Thank you, Vinny. Is there anybody else who would like to testify either in support or opposition on this project? John Lane, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, this, I am, my name is John Lane. I am a member of the Impact Advisory Group uh, for the 140 Project. Uh, this is an intensely personal uh, project to me. Uh, I spent five plus years chronically homeless in Boston um, as a resident of various programs at uh, Pine Street, uh, the shelters out on Long Island back when the bridge was open and then shelters at 112 and in the gym when the bridge went down. Uh, and I finally got housed uh, through actually uh, case management at Pine Street. Uh, and I now live in BHA uh, housing. Um, I'm a ministry partner with Common Cathedral, a ministry partner with St. Paul's Cathedral, their MANA program, both which do outreach to people experiencing homelessness and I also work now in the shelter I used to stay at at 112 Southampton. I work for the Public Health Commission. And so I see what, uh, you know, is going on on a daily basis and the folks experiencing homelessness uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and the situation is worse, quite frankly, than I remember from five or six years ago uh, in terms of uh, the need for supportive housing. Um, I found community through a church. I did not have uh, supportive housing in my uh, housing, but I got here through Pine Street, through their advocacy, uh, and I know how important um, community is. It's really just the thing that keeps people from going into a box and being there with themselves and maybe a free TV. Uh, it's what keeps people moving forward, progressing, and getting to a point where they can become once again contributing members of society. So I speak out very strongly in favor of this program, uh, in front of the favor of this building. It seems incredibly well researched and planned, uh, and I was happy to be a part of the IAG. Thanks. Thank you, John. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak in favor or opposition of this project? Please indicate by using the blue hand. Hold, uh, Gary, uh, no, I guess Gary Walker. Okay, I guess, hang on. Go ahead, Gary Walker. Oh, never mind. I think he might be having difficulty. Um, I think this um, con concludes the public testimony for this, for this project. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Are there any phone, people on the phone? No, nope, there are not, there are not any, there's nobody on the phone. Very good. Okay, that will end the public comment period for this project. Are there any questions of the board? Just a comment that this project is really exemplary in, in so many ways. Uh, <clears throat> sustainability and public-private partnerships and uh, addressing the needs of uh, homeless people um, and enabling them to, to stay in the city downtown without being shunted off to some remote area and uh, I, I just want to thank all of the uh, 
uh, presenters here and the participants for for the work that uh, that you've done to pull this together. Um, I mean, it's just it it is as as Newport has suggested um, uh, potentially a national model, and I hope that it gets the kind of publicity uh, that it should. It's it's just a wonderful piece of work. Very good. Sir. Any further questions, comments? Hearing none, what's the pleasure of the board? Very happy to move that we approve this project. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs. Aye. Dr. Landsbach. Aye. Mr. Miller. And I am voting with the motion. Mr. Mr. Miller has recused himself on this question. Oh, that's right. Sorry. That's right. Um, so um, that is the vote, which uh, passes. Congratulations, and thank you for your presentation. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate it. Thank you, Dawson. Okay, moving on to where we left off before we went to the public comment period is 26 contractual. I move that we pay our bills. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call. Ms. Downs. Aye. Dr. Landsbach. Aye. Mr. Miller. Who's not joined us? And myself in favor of the motion. Uh, motion passes. Number 27, director's update. Mr. Goldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, through you to the members. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, uh, making a few remarks about the language access plan that you approved tonight at the presentation uh, by staff. Uh, this is an important step forward in an effort that, that we've been working on since the arrival of, of Mayor Walsh uh, at City Hall in 2014. At that time, the mayor uh, insisted that, that the, the, the agency um, do a better job at empowering neighborhoods, uh, doing a, a better job of reaching people who otherwise might normally uh, not have access to, um, to information and to not only provide them with information, but to provide them with a meaningful voice on the planning affairs and the development affairs in the neighborhood. So, so we've taken a lot of steps over the past seven plus years to empower neighbors and neighborhoods more, to give them a meaningful voice in the decisions that are made and the decisions that we make. Uh, understanding that, that long, long in the past um, are the days when uh, this agency governed from the top down, that, that the, the old Boston Redevelopment Authority knew what was best and, and did what it thought was best in a neighborhood. Uh, the, 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 the work we do today takes our lead from the neighborhood, uh, works for consensus, gains um, support for the activity that we think makes a better Boston for, for all Bostonians all along the socioeconomic spectrum. So, so what, what the, 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 the recent step, um, the, the step you've taken tonight is to adopt a language access plan because the city that I grew up in, the city that many of us grew up in, uh, in the 70s and 80s and even the 90s is a was a radically different place than it is today. This is a very different place, uh, demographically, um, socioeconomically, and in, in a big part of that change, that metamorphosis, is that the, the city is a far more diverse place. Um, it is now a majority non-white. And along with the diversity uh, that characterizes uh, modern Boston, is a is a is a greater multiplicity of, lang of languages, and thousands of people in Boston are not English proficient. But at the same time, if our goal is to be more transparent, to, to 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 ensure that people understand what we're proposing, what developers are proposing, what uh, planning exercises are contemplating, if neighbors are to really understand that and then have a meaningful voice in it. Uh, we need to be communicating with them very basically in a language that they understand. So we've been doing a lot of that since 2014, but more ad hoc, more discerning where there's a need for language or responding to requests 
uh, for translation services. But now what we're doing, um, and haven't really been doing for months, but ratifying it in tonight's vote is to adopt the language access plan that makes that approach consistent across uh, the range of BPDA, BPDA activities in the neighborhoods uh, throughout the city. So it's a really important step. It is a very progressive step. Uh, we think that we go toe to toe with any ma other major city in America and probably a lot better when it comes to providing language access, translation of key documents, um, uh, of, of, of written documents and providing uh, uh, oral interpretation uh, to people in the languages that they understand and communicate in. So I just want to thank you and celebrate that for a moment, that this policy um, provides both understanding and a meaningful voice uh, to people who otherwise would not um, uh, perhaps readily understand uh, the activities that were engaged in, in the neighborhoods. Um, so, so I salute uh, the approval tonight and I salute the really hard work of a lot of staff who, who developed this program, who developed this policy, but more importantly, will implement it. The implementation of this will be arduous um, it will be time consuming. There will be expense associated with it, but it's the right thing to do. And it's an important um, continuation of the transformation of this organization uh, in, in, in its effort to be more sensitive to the needs of the people that we serve. Uh, linkage, last month, uh, you, this board approved uh, a change to uh, the city's uh, linkage policy. And uh, that went on to the city zoning commission. Um, yesterday, the zoning commission voted unanimously to approve a text amendment to the zoning code that increases linkage fees collected from large scale commercial development by 42%. Uh, Mayor Walsh has now signed that increase into law. This board recommended approval of the increase at our meeting in February. The new rate is now $15.39 per square foot of commercial development in the city, of which $13 will be dedicated to affordable housing and $2.39 will be dedicated to work for us training. This increase was a result of House Bill 401 Zip 4115 legislation that was signed into law by Governor Baker in mid January, less than eight weeks ago. So, this has all moved very briskly. Uh, this legislation allowed for linkage at the municipal level to be adjusted to be more closely aligned with today's market. This will continue to allow the city of Boston to leverage funding for affordable housing and job training, many millions of dollars per year through commercial development. And it will yield significantly more resources for these urgent needs for our city's residents. So it began with a proposal um, here at City Hall and up to the state legislature by Mayor Walsh. It was approved by the legislature, uh, ultimately approved by this board, approved by the Zoning Commission, and became law with the signature of the mayor. Uh, within the past 24 hours. So a really bit of good news as we uh, continue our effort to make sure that we, can, we, are, we are tapping private development to deliver resources for the people of Boston who need them when it comes to workforce development and affordable housing. Finally, I'd like to congratulate one of our employees, one of the members of the team here at the BPDA, Gisela Soriano, uh, who has been named a 2021 Latina leader by Amplify Latinx as part of their Women's History Month celebration. Uh, Gisela has worked for the agency since 2017, and she currently serves as a credit analyst for the BPBA 
and supports both the Boston Local Development Corporation, the LDC, and the Boston Industrial Development Financing Authority, BIDFA. Uh, over the past several years, Gisela has worked to expand the agency's outreach to diverse communities within Boston. She'll be honored at a virtual ceremony celebrating the 2021 awardees on March 18th, so just a few days from now. Congratulations, Gisela, on this recognition for the important work that you do. And I'm sorry I misspoke. One final thing. This is a good number. Uh, tonight, you've approved um, 307 residential units, so 307 new units of housing in the city of Boston, but 230 of them are income restricted. So 75% of the units you've approved tonight are income restricted. That's an important number that again will deliver um, housing uh, to, uh, in, in many cases, some of um, the city's vulnerable residents and their families. Um, and uh, that's a number we can all be uh, proud of as a result of tonight's board meeting. So uh, with that, uh, thank you so much and uh, have a good rest of the evening. I look forward to seeing you virtually in April. Good night. Thank you, Director Golden. Any questions of the director? Hearing none, is there a motion? I move we adjourn this meeting. Second. Motion made and seconded. Roll call, Ms. Downs. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. I think it's not joined us back, and I am voting in favor. The motion passes, and if there's nothing further, have a great night.